So the format today is going to be that we're going to um, hear from each of our three scholars who will talk about different aspects of um, Harakazuo's work um, for about half an hour each. And then we'll have a question, and then the filmmaker will respond to um, what they have said. And, um, and then we'll have a question and answer kind of round table format where we can freely discuss the, um, all the ideas that have been raised. And then um, at the end, we'll have a buffet lunch that you're all welcome to enjoy. Um, yesterday, we had the chance to see two of Harakazuo's best known films, Kyokushiteki Eros, Koi Uta, Ichi Kyu Nanayong, or Extreme Private Eros, Love Song 1974, and Yukiyuki Yuki Te Shingun, The Emperor's Naked Army Marches On. Certain things that came out of those events that really seem central, really seem central to understanding Harasan's work. One is the centrality of the protest movements, or Zen Kyoto, of the late 1960s and early 70s as a grounding force in terms of values and energy for those works. Um, Hara Kazuo centers these films on very powerful and unusual energetic individuals and seeks to uncover and show the unexpected, embarrassing, and in some ways invisible parts of everyday life as they rise to broader significance. The protests here take place in every corner as we view the pervasiveness of the ideologies of family and nation and social behavior within individuals and in their interactions with the world. In some ways, both Takeda Miyuki and Okuzaki Kenzo are solitary artists in the strong sense of the term, conducting their protests on the grounds of contemporary Japan, punctuated by polite apologies and passionate verbal and physical fights in dizzying alternation. I actually wound up having a dream about Takeda Miyuki after that. <laughs> um, anyway, the zenshin, or dedicated, full-bodied action um, idea stretches to all of these subjects, ways of putting one's whole body and self on the line in a way that one can sense as an extension of those moments of protest. But it also reinvents and reframes the meaning of those ideology-challenging, establishment-crunching times in a way that retains its force and strength long after those specific moments were um, weakening or past. Hara's prize-winning films include those two, as well as the 1972 Sayonara CP, um, Say Goodbye CP, a Dedicated Life, which is Zen Zenshin Shosetsuka from 1994, and Watashi no Mishima from 1999, as well as Mata no Hino Chika um, from 2004 to 5. Um, today, we'll get to hear about a number of these earlier, as well as more recent films from our three speakers, whom I'll introduce now. And then we'll hear a response from the director, and we'll have a chance to open up to a dialogue, as I said, with both our honored guests and our speakers, and with you. Um, so I'd also like to mention the exciting occasion of the publication of, uh, of the book, first book of translations of Harakazuo's writings, um, Camera Abstrusa, um, the action documentaries of Harakazuo, which um, will be available for you to peruse on the desk over here. And um, if you want to um, get a hold of a copy and have not yet, um, you can speak to um, Duncan Williams, Professor Duncan Williams, about it. And it will also be on sale at many bookstores. Um, so our first speaker, I think I'm going to just introduce all the speakers in a row and then we'll have them, have them speak. Our first speaker is Professor Marcus Nornes, um, who is Professor of Asian Cinema in both the Department of Screen Arts and Cultures and the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Michigan, where he specializes in Japanese film and documentary. He's the author of Cinema Babel a theoretical and historical look at the role of translation in film history. He also wrote Forest of Pressure, Ogawa Shinsuke, and Post-War Japanese Documentary, and Japanese Documentary Film from the Meiji Era to Hiroshima from Minnesota University Press, as well as many articles in edited volumes and journals, such as Cinema Journal and Film Quarterly. He has co-edited um, books including Japan American Film Wars, in praise of film studies, and many film festival retrospective catalogs. And his research guide to Japanese cinema, co-authored with Professor Aaron Jarrow, who's also one of our speakers, um, is forthcoming from the University of Michigan Center for Japanese Studies publications. And both uh, Professor Nornes and Professor Jarrow at different times 
were coordinators for the Yamagata International Documentary Film Festival. Um, and Professor Nornes programmed major retrospectives there. Um, in terms of um, Harakazu's work, um, he, Pro Professor Nornes has two really interesting articles um, on this topic. One is called The Postwar Documentary Trace, Groping in the Dark, which is in positions um, 10, number one, from 2002, and Private Reality, Harakazu's Films, which was published in um, Ivan Margu, I don't know how to pronounce her, Ivan Margulius's edited volume, which is entitled Rights of Realism from Duke University Press. Those are both really, really interesting articles that I encourage you to check out. Um, and um, so then our next speaker will be Aaron Jarrow. As I mentioned, he's, um, both of them run the Kina Japan listserv, so they're very central to um, the work of um, the sort of informal communities around Japanese film and the budding scholarly community that are trying to work on Japanese film in the United States and also internationally. Aaron Jarrow arrived at Yale in January of 2004, and he teaches undergraduate courses in introduction to film, Japanese cinema, close analysis of film, and the Western, as well as graduate seminars on Japanese film and cultural theory. He received an MFA in film studies from Columbia University in um, 1987 and an MA in Asian Civilizations from the University of Iowa in 1992 and a PhD in Communication Studies from Iowa in 1996. He spent nearly 12 years in Japan working for the Yamagata International Documentary Film Festival and teaching at Yokohama National University and Meiji Gakuin University. And he's published many articles in English, Japanese, and other, language, other languages on topics like Japanese early cinema, contemporary directors, film genre, censorship, Japanese manga, and cinematic representations of minorities. So he's really spanned the range of um, eras and, and possible topics to write about within Japanese cinema. His book on Kitano Ta Takeshi was published by the BFI in 2007, so very recently, and his monograph on a page of madness came out from the Center for Japanese Studies at the University of Michigan in 2008. So really recent, hot off the press publications. Um, the same center, um, as I said, just published their research guide to Japanese film studies, um, which is a guide to the discipline, its resources, and its archive. His book on early Japanese film culture and discourse will be published by the University of California Press. Um, the Japanese version will be coming out from the University of Tokyo Press. So there's a lot of great forthcoming work from Professor Jero as well. Um, Akira, Professor Akira Mizuta Lippet um, is also a leading figure in the field of Japanese cinema, but without actually um, narrowly sticking to the world of area studies, but someone who has really been able to kind of break the wall that defines the edge of area studies and been able to kind of redefine the terrain of this field. Um, he teaches in the School of Cinematic Arts at USC, as well as the Departments of Comparative Literature and East Asian Languages and Cultures. Um, Professor Lippitt is the author of two books, Electric Animal, Toward a Rhetoric of Wildlife from 2000, and Atomic Light Shadow Optics from 2005. He's working on several new projects, all of which sound really exciting, including a book on contemporary Japanese cinema, another on spectrality in film, and still another on David Lynch. And um, Professor Lippitt has been instrumental in also opening up the um, more geographically bound world of film studies to Japanese cinema by hosting, helping to organize the hosting of the Society for Cinema and Media Studies in Tokyo in just a few short weeks. So um, we're really looking forward to that. And um, let's please welcome our speakers. Thank you very much. Um, today, I thought I would provide just a little bit of historical context for Hara, and also um, draw a little bit from that article that Miriam mentioned, um, Private Realities. And uh, I'm gonna show you some clips as well. And one reason is to revisit the films and from a slightly different perspective, uh, try to relook at them uh, for the way that Hara is playing with convention. Oops. And uh, why don't we put that, can you start the, 
projector, and I need to explain something about this DVD because the menu is a little bizarre. This was left over from a uh, event I programmed at University of Michigan where Hara came to Ann Arbor to meet Michael Moore. <laughs> and uh, I tried to make a new menu background, but the file was corrupted, so there you go. Um, if you want to, it was a fascinating visit, by the way, and if you want to learn a little bit more about it, buy the book, and in the, my, the foreword I wrote a little bit about that. Um, so, let's begin just be by um, talking about where how, the, the context from which Hara emerged, um, because I think it really helps understand what's going on in his films. And I guess you could bump this back to World War II, because it's World War II when you had basically propaganda film and nothing else. It was highly fictive, naturally. It was highly conventional. And uh, very few films broke away from those conventions, especially towards the last years of the war. And then after the war, you ended up with a documentary scene that was located in small companies. And these small companies were making both PR films and education films, and they were often you know, flying the flag of democracy. And in terms of style, however, they were drawing on the same kinds of codes that people were using in the 1930s and into the war, which is to say that they were also highly fictive. We often associate this with uh, John Grierson and Paul Rotha in the West. Rotha was particularly a powerful presence in pre-war Japan. And the idea was that uh, you went out into the world and you shot, but you shot after, uh, off of a scenario. Most of these films were highly scripted. You would use non-actors. Um, and the codes, cinematic codes, very close to Hollywood in terms of the construction of time and space. And this started changing, however, in the late 50s. And interestingly enough, it's very, it coincides with developments all over the world. But the people who were doing it in Japan didn't seem to be uh, aware of what was going on in other parts of the world. The person that's most key and useful just for our purposes is Hani Sosumu. You might know him from his fiction films, but his first documentary films were really quite amazing. He would show, set up a camera in a school and shoot and shoot and shoot, and he discovered that kids would just like forget that you were there. And the films had this spontaneity that really hadn't been seen in documentary before, and it was, it was incredibly striking to people. And it started breaking down people's conceptions of documentary. This is like the first step towards Harakazawa, I think. And they started thinking, documentary can do other kinds of things. Or the kind of reality that we were seeing in the 1950s documentary wasn't so real. There were other ways that were more real. And Hani was working in a company called Iwanami. And Iwanami was a test, it's like a laboratory, it turned out to be, for trying new things in documentary. It was because they had fairly enlightened leadership, which created this free space for filmmakers to try new stuff. And these filmmakers were people like, who, somewhat, who went on to both documentary and fiction, like uh, Higashi Yoichi, Kuroki Kazuo, um, and then the two titans that Harasan mentioned yesterday, Tsuchimoto Noriaki and Ogawa Shinsuke. And then, but also cameramen and sound people. Uh, cameramen like uh, Tamura Masaki and Suzuki Tatsuo. F these, are, these are cinematographers who were willing to break all the rules and see what happened. And they turned out to be extremely influential forces in the films of the 60s and beyond. This is particularly true because around 1964, these guys quit Iwanami, and they went independent. And a lot of other people were going independent as well. The avant-garde was starting to really flourish, and independent documentary did as well. Um, now, the films were about everything you can imagine. 
and uh, probably the most prestigious were the films of Olga Wyszynskie. And of course, I'm, this is one of their films, it's from 1973, but I wanted to just play it in the background to kind of give you a sense for what was going on out there when Hara was starting to consider a life in film. This is uh, Ogawa's uh, Peasants of the Se Third Fortress. And um, you had a lot of student movement films, a lot of films connected to various kinds of movement, uh, avant-garde films that were, I mean, that blurred any kind of lines between documentary and the experimental. It was a, a really exciting time. And out of this context also arose these two biggies, Tsuchimoto and Ogawa. Tsuchimoto was out making films about um, Minamata disease and Ogawa in the airport construction site of Narita Airport. Uh, this is what it looked like. It was close to civil war. People were dying in these protests and there were tens of thousands of participants in, in these riots. Ogawa was special and Tsuchimoto was special, partly because of the way they were reconceptualizing documentary. And they were trying to reconceptualize it around a special relationship between the person being filmed and the filmmaker. And it's very striking to talk to Japanese documentary filmmakers, even today, because they talk this language. Uh, they use, uh, for subject or shutai, they're talking about themselves not the subject of the film like we would think of in English. That would be the taisho, or an object. And the Ogao and Tsuchimoto focused on this relationship between filmmaker and filmed, and uh, heightened it, built it into the film, and tried to, in a sense, defer the powers of the filmmaker to the person being filmed, to really try to think from their space to be in their space and, and make a film and conceptualize a film from there. And Ogawa is the one who often gets mentioned more than Tsuchimoto though because of the way that he pushed things to limits. Uh, you notice that Hara mentioned him yesterday and if you read his book, Ogawa is sprinkled throughout and the reason is that Ogawa was really trying to do something new and his subject and object were also collective. So he thought of the filmmaking project as something you did as a group, and you shot pictures of groups. And um, what's kind of curious about Harasan is that he is, in a sense, taking the same paradigm but flipping it and making it very personal. It's, it's about an individual shooting an individual. And um, bringing a, a, a private twist to, the, to things. And he thought about actually joining Ogawa Productions, but instead decided that it wasn't for him, and he would um, go out, strike out on his own, and he made his first film, Sayonara CP. And I want to show you a clip from this. And when you're watching this, I want you to think of this as an interview. Think of it as an interview and um, recall, remember that, interestingly enough, this did not have Japanese subtitles. We have English subtitles, which allows us to understand very well, but this thing was a film that people had to really struggle to understand. あ、
このまま来るからね見せ物的なものになってしまってるからねこれちょっと控えてくれなこのままに始めるようですから保護しますから何もいやっぱり自分は何かできんじゃないかとこういう映画映画をすることだすることはできんじゃないかというようないやそういう考えが僕のどこかにいやだってもうもうもうもうねえてえなこれが作っていくえが作っていく家庭制度だって言ってもが僕もこの身を身を取りに僕家庭だもん。I think of this as an interview that puts you in a very special place, and I'll get to that in a minute.、Um, he goes on then to make extreme private arrows. And this is a really important moment in film history, actually, in Japanese social and political history as well. Hara san yesterday talked a lot about Zen Kyoto when all of the student movements tried to basically get together and make the movement.、Uh, Hugely you know, monolithic and powerful, but of course, at the very same time, it was raked by、uh, internecine conflict,、uh, actually, which became quite violent at times. People killed.、Um, this climax is with the Asama cottage incident, where the Red Army tortures and kills its own. At the very same time, you had、um, huge historical events like the end of the Vietnam War. The normalizations of, of、uh, political relationships with China, which of course set off the student movement because suddenly communist China was allied with the government that they were trying to fight themselves.、Uh, the studio system in the film industry was falling apart. Pink film was being appropriated by political activists. The solid、uh, masculine films of, ni of the Ninkyo Yakuza films like Takura Ken were being replaced by crazy, crazy films by Fukusaku Kinji. Everywhere you looked, you could see some shifts happening. And even in Ogawa Productions, which had by this point spread its collectives all over Japan, all over Japan. it had units, other offices. Those started, however, breaking down. And in this context, Hara's film appears. And you have suddenly this film that's so extremely private. It was a very powerful experience. And it led to、um, a shift in practice in documentary film.、Um, it's, it's not just Hara, it's other people too, especially Suzuki Shiroyasu from the experimental film. But、uh, There was a decided shift from this collective social movement cinema to private films, films that were located around the self. But the thing is, as time went on, these films became almost hermetically sealed around the self. And as a symptom of that, you can just see how so many of them are set in the space of the home without leaving it, or the family and friends without confronting. People out in the world as a self and another. 
these were not others that destabilized your own sense of who you are, things like that as much. And so they're not as interesting. And every time he, you heard him talk about this yesterday, he, he himself finds this extremely frustrating and perplexing. Um, so in a sense, I guess what I'd, what I'd like to assert is that in Japanese documentary, we often talk about big names like uh, Kame Fumio or Ogawa Shinsuke or Tsushimoto Noriaki, but actually I think we can say there's documentary before Hara and after Hara. This is a better periodization, a better way to think. He's truly this very transitional figure because he's both. He, he's managed to combine both and do both and in incredibly powerful ways. And to me, one of the things that's most exciting about his films is the way that uh, I mentioned that filmmakers were really thinking about the film, the film filming subject and the filmed object and highlighting that relationship. Hara, I think, really adds the spectator to the equation. It's more of a triangulation within his films. Um, it's about an intersubjective engagement that's working in in different avenues. And um, let me re read a quote, actually, from the book that I think really highlights this. He, this is actually something he said on the stage in Ann Arbor when he met Michael Moore and confronted him and said, this gets to the major difference, as I see it, between Michael's work and mine. What I try to do in documentary films is really to work towards the emotions of the people in the audience, to energize them. Michael does this through his words. I think I do it through bodies. I'd like to leave people in the audience aching and itching in their desire to do something with their bodies after seeing my films. I'd like to kidnap their bodies in that way. It's interesting he uses the word kid kidnap here because what you see in these films is very complex and subtle circulation of power in all sorts of different directions. And uh, judging from the title of Akira's paper, maybe he's going to be talking about this. In any case, one of the ways that you see this happening is through the novel use of old conventions. And interview is the one I want to focus on today. Think of um, this as an, I mean, think of this as an interview and how it's different and similar to things that you're used to watching. There's sound here. Okay. Okay. I want you to listen very carefully to his narration. I, so I want to say something about that. Listen to how he's using language as a voiceover narrator. Ah, that's not supposed to happen. Sorry about that. Three度目は、まだだいたい一ヶ月後、この映画をこう一緒にやってる小林幸子と二人で沖縄へ来たわけです。みゆきさんの絵だってね、原君はその自分の関わり、自分とね、みゆきさんとの関わりのね、追求だっちゅうわけね。だけど私はその、そんなさ、原君のことはどうでもいいってことがあってさ、私は私とさ、みゆきさん
it's coaxing you as a spectator. I mean, it's not this voice of God narration that we usually associate with documentary voiceover. It's, it's informal, it's filled with ahs and ums and uh, almost like pausing to think. It's uh, using a lot of sentence final prog particles like ne, you know, coaxing you to identify. Um, it's very, very special. It's bringing you into a relation, this relationship going on here. Um, and I think you can think of uh, Yuki Yuki Tishingu in The Emperor's Naked Army Marches On as an interview film as well. I mean, Hara interviewing people, but Okazaki interviewing people as well. And challenging your sense of ethics and everything else, your war memory, uh, many things. So, um, thinking about convention, interviews, intersubjectivity in the documentary. Um, one of the most interesting books I've read that de deals with this kind of subject is Virtualities by Margaret Morse. And she makes a very convincing case for understanding the cultural position of TV in the late 20th century. Um, she's basically interested in how we've come to grant human qualities of like subjectivity to machines. She's thinking mostly of computers and TV here. Human beings have this deep need for intersubjective inter engagement, she says. And it's a desire that TV engages as a machine featuring simulation of human subjectivity. And so think about the most powerful form on TV. It's the head and shoulders speaking out at you as a, as a uh, viewer, almost as if you're talking across a desk. In other words, TV has modeled one of the key features of human communication. She draws on Derrida, especially um, his signature event context article, to argue, to argue that the gap between enunciation and meaning is what makes TV possible. Here's a quote from her. The argument to be made here is not that once there was something sincere and unmediated called face-to-face -face communication, in which exchanges mediated by television and the computer are inherently inauthentic or debased simulations. If anything, machine subjects are made possible. Machine subjects, um, she's talking about people like Peter Jennings or someone like that, an anchor. They're made possible by the fundamental gap that has always existed between language and the world and between utterances, be they subjective or impersonal. And the act of enunciation, whether it's produced by a human subject or has been delegated to machines. Now, Morse points to a human need for and pleasure in being recognized as a partner in discourse. Even if a machine stands in between subjects, there's pleasure here. And this explains one of the reasons that documentary um, has, has persisted for a century, even if it's always been mar. Uh, relegated to this marginal position, it's been so durable. And I think this is one of the reasons. Um, think about the most powerful forms in the documentary. It's the interview, direct address, things like this, things where we're, we're caught into a relationship, uh, an intersubjective relationship with what's going on in the film. Most critical attention in doc documentary theory has gone to innovative and politically progressive works of performative documentary. You think of peop people like Barbara Hammer or Marlon Riggs, Trin Min Ha. And because of this focus, documentary theory and criticism um, probably hasn't dealt adequately with television, especially post-direct cinema television. Even though the vast majority of documentary now is actually being distributed through this medium. When you think about document, non-fiction, moving image media, most of it is TV, of course. Now, while the relationship between documentary realism and television really hasn't been mapped, we can see that the emergence of interview-heavy documentary coincides with the rise of TV as a cultural form. So the pleasures of documentary might not be reducible to virtual engagement with charismatic on-screen subjectivities, but it's, it's a, certainly a, stun, a starting point, a very fundamental starting point. Now, Hara intrigues because there's no question that the interview with these spectacular 
the charismatic figures, is his starting point as well. But he diverts us to another dimension in intersubjective engagements mediated by cameras and screens. Indeed, from a historical perspective, the formal break that we usually associate with Ogawa and Tsuchimoto was exactly a search for a style that foregrounds the intersubjective nature of nonfiction filmmaking. And in their case, it's by immersing the documentary process in social communities that were under siege. Hara it, it basically extended these innovations by turning the camera to the self with this action documentary of his. And what's um, it's significant <coughs> that Hara chooses his objects so carefully. He clearly takes delight in approaching highly glamorous and even dangerous objects. His own humanity and his desire for discursive exchange with these seductive other subjects are mediated by machines at a different level. And that's, um, in other words, his machine is the camera. This is what's so distinctive about his cinema. If Think about the opening sequence of Extreme Private Arrows, where he states um, this dynamic rather directly, I think. He said, I have this relationship. I was losing her, and I couldn't let her go. It seemed the only way to keep our relationship going was to make a film, right? But it's also what he has most strongly in common with his other fellow documentarists in Japan, at least in the post-war era. And that's this definition of documentary practice in terms of a relationship between the Shutai subject filmmaker on the one hand and the Taisho object filmed on the other. Film, in this case, is the, it's a vestige of this relationship captured on celluloid and offered up for virtual engagement with us. Um, that that um, voiceover in Eros, right? The fact that he, he chose not to have subtitles in Sayonara CP, forcing you to just throw yourself into that film, to struggle to, uh, to create this intersubjective relationship with those people. It was so hard and thus foregrounded. Hara's often said that documentary is the recording of ki. Now this is a really loaded term. Um, Chinese character itself refers to, uh, are you ready? Spirit, mind, soul, heart, intention, bent, interest, mood, feeling, temper, disposition, nature, case, attention, air, atmosphere, flavor, odor, energy, essence, air, indication, symptoms, taste, touch, dash, shade, trace, spark, flash, suspicion. These are all meanings of that, straight from the dictionary. Um, and it's also commonly combined with verbs in a kind of montage um, of characters so that uh, you create different kinds of inflections. You can do key, which means you're nervous about something. You can have key, have an intention. Uh, you can notice something when you attach key. You, key stands when you get excited, or you become key when you worry, and so on and so on. So what does it mean when Hara says uh, to record key? And I think it has to do with Describing a trace of that intersubjective moment of filmmaking, committing it to celluloid or tape in order to offer it up again for another intersubjective moment in the performance of the theater. And Hara, he brings us to this point by discovering the performance at the heart of documentary, a discovery he makes by aggressively penetrating private spaces in this so public a media. This is why Hara is really the most exciting of all the Japanese documentaries, one of the great documentaries of the world. The actors in Hara's last films also appear keenly aware that to some inestimable degree, the, the deployment of fictions approaches a knowledge that's embodied and social and escapes this logic of true, false, or real, unreal. And needless to say, this is not the conventional wisdom of the documentary. For, document, for Hara carries us back to an, in an arc that touches on that pre-Iwanami era, era documentary, uh, that Grissonian documentary, without actually planting us there 
uh, returning us for a full circle. He circulates, and that's one of the most interesting things about him. I'll stop there and hand it off to Aaron. Thank you. I first would like to uh, thank, of course, uh, Duncan and Miriam and everyone here for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's quite a pleasure to uh, talk about Halasan. Way back in 1993, I did my first interview with Halasan. Uh, and this is, in some ways, a, I, a revisiting of uh, my relationship with, with Halasan. Uh, uh, the films that were shown yesterday, of course, very important films. Uh, and of course, Marcus also uh, was talking about those films. But today I want to talk about actually what is technically his most recent film, uh, The Many Faces of Chica, which is actually a fiction film. Uh, many of you probably have not seen this, but I would like to pose this film uh, as a way of talking about not only Halasan's career, but also in some ways as a way of talking about the present state of cinema in Japan, or at least Hala's attempt to <coughs> talk about that. Uh, and one way of starting this discussion is to mention that over dinner last night, the conversation moved to, well, what do you think about the future of Japanese film? And Hara-san was basically staying, say, stating that it's very dismal. He's very dismayed by the future of, or the possibility of Japanese cinema. In some ways, I want to uh, ask whether or not uh, The Many Faces of Chika is his uh, embodiment in film of this kind of dismay. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> this again is uh, Hara's first fiction film. Uh, he started filming it in 2000, had some financial problems, so it took until 2004 to finish making it. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, a documentarist making a fiction film is not unusual, especially in Japan. Uh, one can see uh, many, many, many figures from Japanese film history. Uh, you can divide these perhaps into the older ones, uh, uh, going back, of course, to Kamei Fumio, who uh, made some fiction films in the post-war. Uh, there's the generation who emerged in the 1960s. Uh, people like Kuroki Kazo, uh, Matsumoto Toshio, Higashi Yoichi, uh, lots of figures who started out in documentary and moved on into fiction film. You also had the interesting uh, reverse uh, direction, where many filmmakers that you're familiar with uh, in fiction film also made quite a number of documentaries, uh, like Oshima, Imamura, uh, even uh, a radical pink filmmaker, uh, like Adachi Masao, uh, uh, made some works. Uh, this is also a phenomenon you see in the last 10 or 15 years as well. Uh, Many of you are familiar with names like Kawase Naomi or Koreeda Hirokazu, but did you know that they actually started out in documentary? Uh, and they still maintain that, that crucial relationship. Uh, other filmmakers like Suwa Nobuhiro also uh, started out or at least have certain roots in documentary. And again, you also see the reverse, where uh, people who are ostensibly fiction filmmakers like uh, Aoyama Shinji, or even a very young woman filmmaker like Tanada Yuki, uh, are also making uh, documentaries. So you've had this relationship between documentary and fiction uh, for at least half a century in Japan. Uh, it's, so it's very, very crucial. So it's not unusual to see someone like Hala engage with this history. <clears throat> but I want to argue that uh, Hala-san at least with uh, The Many Faces of Chika, is engaging with fiction film in a way that's different from either of these generations. And especially, I think, he's posing a contrast with people who are working today there. Um, <clears throat> uh, some people, including Hara-san himself, talk about The Many Faces of Chika as the fiction film version of Extreme Private Eros. Uh, why, in fact, it is, in some ways, about a man, or actually many men, including not only the characters in the film, but also perhaps Hala, the director himself, uh, pursuing uh, a very, very uh, passionate, multifaceted woman 
who uh, is in some ways seeking her own independence and freedom, uh, that attempt to pursue her and understand her, but in the end, often failing in that. Uh, the the uh, somewhat unique device that Hala San just used to depict this multifaceted woman is to actually have Chica played by four, actually five actresses. Uh, so you have Chica played by different actresses at different uh, stages in her life. So you have her as a very young woman uh, in 1960, uh, then in 1969, then in 1972, 1974, all these played by different actresses. And these are actually chapters within the film itself. Uh, and finally, the last chapter with uh, Momoi Kaudi uh, as Chika in about 1976 there. Um, <clears throat> uh, now, what ostensibly is the story of The Many Faces of Chika? Uh, on one way of describing it is that it is a story of a fall. In some ways, the fall, the decline of Chika herself. And let me show you uh, uh, a scene from uh, the beginning of the film here. Throughout the film, Halasan will be citing various historical incidents. This is the anti-security treaty demonstrations in 1960. It marks in some ways what period we are. All you see, of course, is on a simple narrative level, the, the fall off the balance beam. But that, in some ways, becomes the beginning of the narrative, that we then see Chika herself fall throughout her life. Uh, so she uh, fails to reach the Olympics, even though she was one of the most promising uh, athletes. Uh, she becomes a gym teacher afterwards, but uh, she progressively gets worse and worse, uh, becomes a, a bar madam, things like that. It's kind of like this classic decline of a woman. Uh, but uh, that's not all that's going on in the film, uh, because there are in some ways other falls as well. So you can see with this clip, for instance, that uh, the man who is talking there, uh, in fact, who appears in the film first as a riot policeman, Yukio, uh, he also 
exhibits his own fall. And in fact, the first fall of the film is his fall uh, in the commotion of the anti-security treaty demonstrations. Uh, so one of the other narratives of this film is not just the fall of Chica, but also in some ways the fall of the men around her, if not a certain kind of authority, especially masculine authority within post-war Japan. Um, and you can see the, the male characters trying to reassert or find that lost masculinity through various means, uh, one of which quite uh, <coughs> blatantly is uh, this fireworks festival where this young man you know, assumes this kind of phallic spewing uh, you know, fireworks cannon. Uh, and he talks about it himself. He's like, this is the way I'm going to become a man. Uh, but uh, in this film, uh, most of these characters do not succeed uh, in this kind of recovery of, of masculinity. Uh, uh, perhaps in, in frustration of that, you see these male characters uh, trying to uh, both possess and uh, um, punish Chica. Uh, I mean, you could read this film uh, through Freud if you want to. Uh, these repeated uh, visions of Chica's fall as uh, either the kind of the primal scene, uh, the realization of the the, the castrated mother, uh, and that the the uh, the male characters try to. Uh, uh, either punish her for that or in some ways uh, possess uh, the woman in various ways. But they all, in many ways, uh, fail with that. Um, <clears throat> uh, they try to insert her in various familial roles. And in some ways, you can see each of the versions of Chica as either wife, mother, sister, uh, various roles that she plays there. Uh, but these also fail, and not only because, and not because Chica resists those, because in some ways she also seeks out these roles, but because she seeks out these roles through a form of sexuality that uh, in danger, is in, uh, threatens to break the taboo against incest. So in fact, her marriage first is to Yukio, who is a character who might actually be her real brother. But the problem is her mother has slept around so much, she just doesn't know. Uh, but she knows that, but actually she actually says, I'm excited by the fact that you might be my brother. Uh, so this kind of dangerous sexuality uh, always threatens to break up these kind of familial relationships there. Um, uh, you can also talk about these falls as serving a kind of allegorical function. Uh, uh, Hara-san's films are very much about his generation from the 1970s. And you can see the fall of Chika as a metaphor for the fall of that generation, uh, as well as, of course, of its history. Uh, you can look at it as a uh, narrative of the fall of the new left, for instance. Uh, because you see, uh, again, archival footage throughout the film of various important political protests moments. You start out with the anti-security treaty demonstrations. Uh, you move on to uh, scenes like uh, the uh, occupation of Yasuda Hall at Tokyo University around 1969, 1970. Uh, you uh, will see, and I'll show you a clip in a moment, uh, the Asama Cottage incident, which Marcus mentioned. Also, uh, the uh, bombing of the uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries office. Uh, in 1974, uh, and these get progressively more violent and more disturbing, uh, you can argue, and the characters comment on that. Um, but intriguingly, uh, one of the ways the film marks the end of this, or the fall of even this, this political trajectory, is that the last incident cites uh, a contemporary real life incident that is not political. It's in fact the, uh, the major fire that took place in 1976 that burnt down uh, much of the downtown of Sakata City in Yamagata, a very non-political incident. Uh, so there's a kind of 
fall of politics as well within the film. Uh, what I want to ask today is whether or not this is also a film that might be about the fall of documentary, if not the fall of cinema, or at least a certain kind of it. Um, <clears throat> uh, Harasan in interviews has himself talked about The Many Faces of Chica as a uh, film which was his way of coming to accounts or being kind of a roundup, a way of rethinking uh, the documentaries that he had made before there. Um, uh, and in these interviews, he also talked about how many of the documentaries that he's made before, in some ways, he cannot make again. That there has been a historical shift. That you know there are just not people like Okazaki Kenzo around anymore uh, to film, uh, if not that kind of filmmaking anymore. Um, now, uh, is then he giving up on documentary and turning to fiction? I'm not arguing that. Uh, we don't see here a kind of argument about reality losing out to fiction. Uh, because in, in some sense, and Marcus has already talked about this a bit, uh, his films have always played with this tension between reality and fiction, especially between recording uh, and the what is recorded reacting to that recording, uh, and therefore that relationship between documentary practice and performance uh, on various levels. Uh, we can look at, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a Dedicated Life, Zenshin uh, Shosetsuka, uh, as a film that very much is about a character who is performing uh, or rewriting his own life. And uh, I want to show you a clip, not only to illustrate how Hala-san, at least in this film from 1970, or 1994, is uh, engaging with this kind of performance, but I also want to have you remember how he's using archival as well as staged footage here. famous author, Inoue Mitsuharu, narrating his first love, something that he has related in many of his novels, and uh, Hara-san is asking him to talk about it again. And supplying, on the one hand, true archival footage, but also staged footage. is the, the payday for
前にこのサイさんがいるわけよ名古屋に来たはずの僕はびっくりしてね Now, in, in the course of the film,、uh, a few scenes later, we find out that, in fact, this is all made up.、Uh, that Inoue, in fact,、uh, made up this incident. Uh, and uh, at that point, then we, we obviously go back and look or rethink、uh, even the,、uh, of course, the recreated footage, but also even the archival footage to think more about that relationship between.、Uh, Not only、uh, film and reality, but also about the problem of narrating that reality and also the performance. But I think in a film like this, we still have a, a, a central discourse that is taking all these different forms of film archival, recreated, interview footage uh, and uh, still structuring them, encompassing them within a certain rhetorical strategy that. Well, on the one hand, obviously questioning the relationship between you know, film and reality, that kind of testimony and what really happened, nonetheless still accepts a, or argues for a certain kind of realism of, of performance or that kind of intersubjectivity that, that Marcus was talking about. That this film is nonetheless uh, uh, engaging with the、uh, processes by which、uh, Inoue Mitsuharu is. Uh, performing his life as well as、uh, bringing, if not embodying in the screen itself, the、uh, processes by which Hara san, as a body there, was、uh, engaging with、uh, his own taisho, his own object there, Inoue Mitsuharu.、Uh, that's what's in some ways being recorded there. But what I want to argue is that、uh, when it comes to the, the many faces of Chika, It seems like Harasan is less confident or is less sure of that, even that possibility. Um, uh, first, I want to point out about how he is engaging with, again, the combination of fiction, film as a genre, and documentary film、uh, in a different way. For instance,、uh, we can, we should remember. Uh, I should note that Hara san, in interviews about this film,、uh, stated quite clearly, I am going to make an orthodox fiction film. This is one thing that I think、uh, distinguishes him from the 1960s generation of documentarists entering into fiction film, many of whom engaged with that, especially someone like Matsumoto Toshio,、uh, through an unorthodox form of fiction film.、Uh, In other words, engaging with the avant garde as a way of complicating the relationship between documentary and fiction. Whereas Hara san, and I think you can tell this with some of the clips you've seen,、uh, in Chika is actually creating a much more formally orthodox film. Why is that?、Uh, I think there's another issue going on here, and this is what distinguishes him from、uh, the 1990s directors who are also. Coming from documentary and starting to make fiction films. People like Koreda or、uh, Kawase Naomi.、Um, many of those directors engage in fiction film by using a mode of filming, which you could consider a long shot, long take style. One that,、uh, you, even if you cite、uh, Andre Bazin,、uh, It might be helpful there as a, as a way of trying to、uh, preserve a certain kind of relationship to reality, even within fiction film, precisely by maintaining、uh, spatial、uh, as well as temporal、uh, integrity. But also, and I think this is very important with a lot of these 90s filmmakers, they want to have the object there、uh, exist on its own.、Uh, That there's an effort to refrain from having a film style that asserts knowledge of、uh, the ability to intervene or even enter or command、uh, the object, the,、uh, the other uh, within the film. Uh, this is a kind of style which I've written about before, I call it the detached style. You can see, especially in a filmmaker like Aoyama Shinji, someone who's really trying to theorize that、uh, in his own writings as well. Uh, uh, Hara san, I think, however, is、uh, 
rejecting that as well. And I want you to look at a, a scene where he is bringing, again, this archival footage and uh, obviously the fictional narrative together, but in a very, very different way here. And this is the scene where, um, let's see, here we go. This is where uh, Chika's husband, Yoshio, uh, finally comes back after three years. He had suffered from tuberculosis, but in the meantime, Chika has been engaging in an in, uh, extramarital affair with another man, Kazuya. Uh, and Kazuya, even though Yoshio is back, has called her and asked her to go meet with him. So Yoshio has an inkling of what's going on. Inserted here are images of, again, Asama Kadich, Asama Sanso. Uh, the very, very infamous incident of uh, Japanese Red Army members uh, killing their own and then taking over a uh, cottage and holding the caretaker hostage. Now what's very peculiar about this scene is uh, these inserts of Asama Sanzo, and they will continue even after the clip that I am showing, uh, are at least narratively possibly explained by the fact that Yoshio seems to be watching television. In other words, these are the TV images that he's watching. But we are never treated to uh, a shot which clarifies that kind of spatial relationship or even that kind of temporal relationship. In fact, we just have this very, very uh, ambiguous image of his back in front of the television. So again, what I think you see here is, uh, whereas some of the contemporary filmmakers, uh, again, like Koreeda or Kawase, are asserting their ability to complicate the relationship between documentary and fiction film precisely by making a fiction film which approaches uh, not realism, because they, they do object to that term, but uh, approaches what you could call the real. Uh, uh, and precisely through a kind of filmmaking which uh, preserves spatial temporal integrity as well as lets the subject exist on its own, kind of respecting it, uh, not intervening in it. Whereas Harasan here uh, connects the archival, the documentary, and the fiction precisely through editing, uh, that which is not supposedly uh, preserving that kind of spatial or temporal integrity. And in fact, the relationship here is one that is, you could argue, quite artificial. It's based on almost point of view editing, that is, uh, a character who seems to be looking at it. But the relationship of the gaze here, or the construction of the gaze, is so blatantly artificial and tenuous that it's very artificial, artificiality is brought out in the f foreground here. Um, and perhaps we can argue then that that is one of the, I think, the points of the film. That while he is engaging in the genre of fiction film there, he is uh, also in some ways despairing of the relationship between documentary and fiction. Uh, that perhaps the only way of uh, relating these is through a kind of artificial, if not fiction film, uh, construction of that. Uh, and I think this in some ways is a, an expression of his own different relationship to reality compared to directors like 
Koreeda, Suwa, or uh, Kawase, uh, because uh, while they, again, are trying to respect the object, respect the subject, not intervene in it, not try to control it, Hara-san's relationship to reality, as, as, as Marcus and others have long argued, always involves intervention, always involves acting on the object, feuding with it, attacking it, uh, and that kind of um, uh, struggle between subject and object is something that first is largely absent with this film. You really don't see that kind of conflict between Hala, the director, uh, and his objects, his, his uh, characters within the film. Uh, and I wonder if combined with his own statements about, you know, there's no one like Okazaki Kenzo anymore, whether or not this film is therefore also a statement about uh, the impossibility or at least the difficulty of that kind of engagement, that kind of political engagement with reality that his previous documentaries uh, represented. Um, uh, instead, he makes this film actually very, very much an acted film. You don't see the kind of spontaneity that marks a uh, documentary from uh, the time of Hani uh, Susumu on. Uh, uh, so I think what you see here is that Hara-san, through this film, is marking out his own difference uh, in a relationship between, not only his relationship which, uh, with reality, but also between cinema's relationship uh, to reality, and marking that as very much a 1970s moment. And that itself is also one of the elements that is experiencing a fall, a decline uh, in this film there. Uh, at the same time, I do want to at least point out some possible alternatives, a kind of hope here. And, and that's to really emphasize that Chika, as a character, I think, is, is, is marked out as quite different. So I want to just show you this one scene here where her second lover, Kazuya, uh, shows her a uh, eight millimeter film. that he discovered among his father's things. フィルムが回り始めると不思議な紫で苦しくなったあの一瞬が近づくと電流が走ったように体が映いた伝説の体操少女谷口近和姿を消しただでもどうしてなんだだって落下は限定 1.0 I mean, narratively here, we can see, of course, uh, the theme of uh, the men obsessed with looking at her, with defining her. And this, in some ways, is something you quite see quite often in Hara's films, about characters who are trying to define uh, a particular reality through their ways of looking at it, through their ways of defining it. Uh, uh, Inoue Mitsuharu is, in some ways, doing the same thing. and the the realities they create, of course, are the different versions of Chika we see throughout this film. So in some ways, thematically, there's a, there's a connection with his, his previous work. Uh, we also see here, of course, that the most direct statement of the fall uh, that at least Chika is, is experiencing. But I also want to emphasize that, uh, and it's hard to see, unfortunately, in this clip, that while uh, Kazuya, but also other men, like we saw with Yukio earlier, are obsessed with looking, but especially looking at media. Uh, we see them looking at films, looking at television, uh, 
repeatedly throughout the film, Chika is not interested in that. She does not look at those media. She looks, and in fact, this is film, a film very much about gazes, but her looks are much more ambiguous. They're much less uh, contained within a media atmosphere. Uh, she tends to look off screen, or she looks at the camera ostensibly at another character, but it's just too strong a gaze to simply be subsumed within uh, a kind of relationship with another character in the mise-en-scene. And finally, there's this uh, one scene where she, it seems like what she's looking at is in fact out of this world. She's looking above uh, the city into the sky, into uh, the stars there. Uh, so Chika first is a character who, uh, while she looks, her looks in some ways escape the conventional uh, uh, spatial or even temporal dynamics of uh, the gaze, uh, as well as escapes that kind of effort to create uh, a reality through the gaze that you see with the other, especially male characters. Uh, and therefore, her gaze, in some ways, uh, escapes the frame in certain ways. And I wonder whether or not that, in some ways, defines uh, Chica as that kind of indefinable, in some ways, unrepresentable figure uh, that the men try to grasp, but she uh, inherently is able to escape uh, through her relationship, uh, not only to uh, reality, but also through her way of looking and engaging with other characters. Uh, and this underlines the fact that I think she's very much a liminal character. Um, but uh, I do want to, so I wonder whether or not Hala is at least uh, speculating about if the male characters are so tied into uh, looking to spectacle, whether or not uh, Hala is despairing about uh, his kind of physical engagement with uh, the object, with reality, whether or not that's being lost in a more specular uh, age where that kind of physical engagement is uh, no longer possible. But I wonder whether or not he's looking to Chika as a way of kind of escaping or redefining the specular uh, th through uh, not what's within the frame, but what's between the frames. Not what chika is, but what's between the different chika. At the same time, since Harasan is a pessimist about the future of Japanese film, I should point out that I think the, the last portions of the film do uh, point out a, a transformation. Uh, one, again, I, I pointed out that the last moment, uh, that last use of archival footage in the film uh, is, in fact, a non-political moment, the, the, the fire in Sakata City in 1976. This is also presented in a different way than the ways I've been showing, how uh, the archival footage was previously you know, kind of thrust in without a clear spatial relationship or even temporal relationship with the uh, other images. Here it quite clearly is, because it's playing on the television in the back where uh, the characters are situated. But, uh, we do have a transformation here, that we have a character, the new and the last male character, uh, Segawa. He's watching this, but he asks Chika to turn off the television. Uh, and I think that's important because that's, that's what defines him as her last man, because he's w one who rejects that kind of mediality uh, himself. And in some ways, that marks the two of them as characters who don't or can no longer belong in this world. Uh, but it's important here that it's television that rules at uh, rules the space at the end here, because the very very last uh, moments in the film are in fact an epilogue, which feature Chika's son, uh, Junichi, or everyone calls him Jun, in the film. Uh, and maybe this is my uh, uh, very very arbitrary interpretation, but. Uh, I would think that the vast majority of Japanese people, when they watch this film, and they 
hear the name Jun Jun, and when they see this actor, Yoshioka Hidetaka, up here with the name Jun, and I see some people in the audience are already laughing at this because they know what's coming, uh, they immediately think of this, Kita no Kunikara, uh, one of the most famous television dramas uh, from the 1980s into the, the 2000s, where the same actor, Yoshioka Hidetaka, from a very young age, uh, up until adulthood, plays the same character, Jun. Uh, Harasan is himself laughing there at the back. So I wonder, and maybe this is just my, my again, my arbitrary uh, interpretation, whether or not this is in some ways, again, the statement that uh, perhaps this is, again, the fall of cinema, and what has arrived instead is uh, the spectacularity of television. Uh, and we'll see if Harasan, with his next film, can deal with this problem, so thank you. Uh, I would also like to thank our hosts today, uh, Center for Japanese Studies and my friend and colleagues, Miriam Sass and Duncan Williams for arranging this event and inviting us here. I'd like to thank uh, Director Harakazo and Kobayashi Sachiko-san, both of whom have given us so much over these past two days not only in the films uh, that we were fortunate to see, and these are both films that I've seen over and over again, and each time I'm struck by uh, entirely new things uh, that I find in them, that I see in them, and my memories of them and my feelings toward them change. And also my fellow panelists who, you know, when I heard they were participating, uh, I, I had to come just to hear what their comments would be, and, and both of them, are, people whose work I admire and, and read regularly, and in the case of, of Marcus in particular, who's written on Harakazuo's work at length, uh, somebody I continue to learn from vis-a-vis -vis Harakazuo as well. But there are three things that distinguish me from my fellow panelists. <laughs> One is I have never uh, directed the Yamagata International Film Festival. <laughs> the second is I have no visual aids uh, today. And the third thing is I've neither interviewed nor written about Harakazo's work in the past. Now, the first two failings are my own. But the third one, not having written about Harakazo uh, to this point, is something that um, in preparing for this event over the past several months uh, struck me. Because I feel that, like my fellow panelists and colleagues, I have been uh, absolutely fascinated with Harakazo's work from the very moment I first encountered it. And the first film I saw was Yuki Yuki Shingun shortly after it was released. And so I, I feel that I have been uh, or engaged with Harakazo's work for a very long time uh, without yet having attempted or made the gesture of trying to write on this work, address it, comment on it, reflect on it. Which isn't to say that I haven't been engaged with the work in a variety of different contexts. I, I teach his work regularly in my classes. Yesterday at the screening, there was a former student of mine at San Francisco State who remembered uh, my showing Yuki Yuki Shingun, The Emperor's Naked Army Marches On, in the context of a course that I was teaching on portraiture. So I have shown Harakazo's work and worked with his work in the classroom. I have been in various conversations, discussions, debates, arguments uh, about the work with colleagues, some of whom focus on Japanese cinema, others who are interested in other aspects of cinema. His name appears and comes up in a variety of different situations uh, that I find myself in. And yet um, I'm struck, uh, even in my very modest presentation today by the fact that I, I don't know what to say about this work. Uh, and I don't think that is uh, a failing <laughs> on my part. Uh, I do think the fact that I've never directed the Yamagata Film Festival or that I didn't bring visual aids are my failings. But the fact that I haven't written on Harakazo's work or that I haven't attempted yet to write on Harakazo's work, uh, I blame Harakazo himself uh, for this problem. Uh, and what I've prepared today, which then was completely destroyed, uh, sorry, this is my visual aid, uh, by the comments that Harakazo and Kobaya Sachiko have made over the last two days uh, by my fellow panelists and the various interventions that 
uh, Miriam Sass and Duncan Williams have made as well, as well as members of the audience who have been interacting over the past two days with Hara Kazuo, has completely further scrambled and complicated and destroyed what semblance of a text uh, I might have prepared today. So I apologize in advance for the mess. But what, I, what I'm thinking about, in fact, consists of a series of very brief interventions or reflections on the subject of the subject in Harakazo's work. And by a question that I'm asked at times by people when I invoke the name of Harakazo, which is, what are his films about? What are his subjects? Who are his subjects? And it occurred to me that Harakazo's work provides, among other things, an occasion to think about the subject. And this sounds like such a terrible place to start anything. Who wants to talk about the subject? Who wants to think about subjects or subject matters for that matter? But it occurs to me that there is something very complicated and very novel at work in Harakazuo's work around the question of subjects, of subjects as we use them in a very kind of colloquial and, let's say, linguistic way, about the notion of subjects as themes, subject matters, as both my colleagues and panelists have touched upon in different contexts, and a, a certain, let's say, torturing of the word subject, a certain kind of kidnapping, to use the, the kind of physical idiom that Marcus invoked around uh, Harakazo's own work, uh, to force this word, this noun, subject, to also become a verb, to subject. And it's in this final threshold, let's say, when we move from subjects as agents, as figures, as individuals, the very powerful subjects that dominate Harakazuo's work, uh, from uh, Yokota and Sayonara CP to Chika in Mata no Hino, Chika, that we find uh, very powerful subjects. There is a very powerful subjectivity at work in Harakazuo's own relationship to his work, something that in a certain perversion, and I mean this uh, in the most grammatical sense of that word, Laura Marx calls a kind of masochism at work in Harakazuo, uh, to the subject matters which deal with a variety of very significant issues from cerebral palsy to radical feminism, wartime memory and responsibility in the institutions of literature, authority, and authorship, among others. But this final term, and the final kind of pressure that one can put on a term like subject, allows us to think about uh, a certain kind of action or activity that's embedded in the word subject, which is to subject, right? to subjugate, to force one's will over another. And it brings up a certain paradox contained in the word subject itself. And I want to just sort of very briefly touch on some of the definitions that will be in play as I move into, uh, as I suggested, a very brief intervention uh, that will allow us then to, to hear Harakazu and Kobayashi Sachiko's responses to these various comments. In a, in a certain, let's say, idiom, in a certain vocabulary, we think of subjects as agents. We think of them as figures. If you think around the areas of literary or critical theory, a certain critique of the subject is presented to us as a critique of power. Right? The subject is the one who occupies certain modes or places of, of power. When we talk about, in, a, in the sort of register of linguistics, the subject of enunciation, we are talking about the one who speaks, the one who is entitled or authorized to speak, the one who is in a position to speak. One of the various definitions that appears around the question of subject appears in the form of a note, which says that in international law, the term subject is convertible with citizen. When we think about a certain uh, uh, inscription, let's say, of the subject, in the context of legal discourses, we are talking about somebody who is entitled to a certain existence, to a certain place, to a certain set of rights that are associated with citizenship and, by extension, subjectivity. 
So on the one hand, the subject is, is an agent. Right? It is a space of agency. Uh, it's a figure that acts, a figure that is allowed to and entitled to act, an active figure, a figure of action, one could say, an action figure. But the very strange etymology of subject, from the Latin subjectus, right, actually resonates with uh, Aaron's presentation uh, just prior, when he talks about the fall. Because the sub in subject, in subjectus, is, refers to below, to throw below. To, to the jectus of subject is to throw. To be subject is to be thrown below, to be thrown under the dominion or authority of a sovereign, a government, an institution of authority. And so if one were to stick to the letter here of the term subject, and if one were to allow this term subject to breathe, as it were, to kind of inhabit uh, the various meanings that come to form this word, we are dealing with a kind of paradox of power. Subject is, on the one hand, the one who acts, the one who is capable of acting, the one who occupies a place or a space within a, a, a set of institutions of identity, of authority, of power. And at the same time, a subject is the one who is subjected, right? the one who submits, where we get a variation of the term subject in subjugation. The subject is the one who bends to the will and authority of another, of another figure. In a sense, the subject is the one who is subjected to the authority of another subject of the other subject, one could even say. And I'm interested in this wordplay only in its relationship to Harakazo's work, because I think the economy of subjectivity, of subjects that flow through in this very complex dynamic we find in Harakazo's work, as Marcus has pointed out, around questions of intersubjectivity, for example, or the way in which intersubjectivity is taken up redefined, transformed uh, in, as Aaron pointed out, in the many faces of Chika, for example, is a theme that remains consistent throughout the work uh, of Harakazo. And it's toward a certain thinking of the paradox of subjectivity in all of its variations that I find at work in Harakazo's cinema that I would like to begin, if possible, uh, uh, my first small adolescent steps, sorry, adolescence already walk, I should say, my infant steps uh, toward a thinking uh, that I feel I have been um, moving toward for 20 some years from the time I first saw the Emperor's Naked Army marches on. A certain wish on my part to understand something that I feel when I see the films, and reminded fully of this yesterday in just the two samplings that we had of, of, of Harakazo and Kobaya Sachiko's work, and also in the various clips that we saw today in my colleagues' earlier presentations. What are Harakazo's films about? What are his subjects? And who are his subjects? How to describe the work of someone whose signature is so pronounced in each work, from work to work, and yet whose signature is often erased or assailed by the sheer force of those whom he depicts? And this would already be, uh, for me, the beginning of a certain problem, let's say, or problematic, problem not in the sense of a flaw, but a problem in the sense of a challenge that appears in Harakazo's work, which is to say, we know definitively when we see this work. And I think as Aaron very brilliantly pointed out, we recognize Harakazuo even when he makes a fiction film, even when he departs from certain, let's say, stylistic or formal features that we have come to recognize in his previous documentary work. And yet, Harakazuo is not a filmmaker who's defined thematically by a set of issues that he returns to over and over again even if those issues exist. Certainly, we couldn't summarize the subject matter of Harakazuo's work in ways that we might with Jean Rouge, right? or Frederick Wiseman, who moves from institution to institution, but sustains in each of these places a certain sense of project, right? of projection, 
as opposed to subjection, a certain kind of line of inquiry. Even somebody like Chris Marker, who moves around the world, is defined by a set of core uh, uh, axioms that are at work. So we feel, on the one hand, and I use this word signature uh, very consciously, a certain authorship, a certain authority that is at work in Harakazo's work, but an authority that at the same time submits or appears to submit to the subjectivity or authority of another. Who or what is the subject of his cinema? One might say, provisionally, that Hara's films are those in which individual subjects overwhelm the subject matter of each film. A conflict between subjects, between individual subjects and subject matters. Yokota Hiroshi versus cerebral palsy, Takeda Miyuki versus feminism, Okuzaki Kenzo versus memory and responsibility, World War II, Inoue Matsuhiro versus the institutions of literature. A, a, a sense in which there is a conflict already set up between subjects and the subject matters that produce them. But is it enough to say that Hara's films are about subjects in conflict? about conflicting subjectivities, about the triumph or defeat of the individual, of individual subjects over the subject matter that nonetheless defines them. Does one say anything by saying this? And what is a subject anyway? In a sense, Hara cinema draws attention to this very question. What type of subject subjugates another? Others, another subject. How does, one subject, how does one become a subject in Hara's films? Various definitions of the word that I've already alluded to include a linguistic subject, the subject of enunciation, which implies a measure of agency, a subject who endures the domination of another, who is subjugated to the will of another, a sovereign, government, or other institution of power. The theme of a book or story, that which forms the basic matter of thought from a definition, to be a subject is to possess at once, and in some irreconcilable fashion, a mode of agency that is also subjected, made subject to the force of another. To be thrown under, quite literally, from the Latin subgisere, an agency discovered, achieved in submission. It is a unique paradox that drives much of Hara's work. And I would begin to think already from my uh, fellow panelists and their presentations, ways in which already this paradox of the subject is at work throughout, and in particular this notion of the fall that Aaron was, was focusing on with regard to the many faces of Chika, right? a certain defining moment that is also framed within a whole economy of subject, subjectivity that allows these many Chikas and the many male subjects that attend to Chika to arise, right? to emerge in this moment of, or at least following from, this fall, which takes on uh, monumental proportions even outside of the, the idiom, when you talk about the fall of man, the fall of uh, humanity, the fall of cinema, in the ways that, that uh, Aaron very provocatively uh, put into play. This paradox, this very particular paradox, between the subject as the one who acts and the one who is acted upon, and that one does not separate, in the case of Hara's film, I think as Marcus was very poignantly pointing out, the very simple line that separates subjects from objects, let's say in a more conventional construction of geometry, but rather the intersubjectivity that is at work, the entry, the immersion, the entry into the space of another that produces, as an effect, subjects who are themselves also subjected. Subjects who become subjects through a kind of subjection. Hara describes an assignment he completed while a student at a technical school for photography, the only meaningful exercise he claims in the entire curriculum. The task, as he describes it, was to surprise someone on the street and take their picture. Uh, and uh, uh, this image of Hara Kazo with the camera running up to people on the street and taking their picture, a kind of violent, assault of the subject. Uh, 
is one that has stayed with me since I heard him first describe this, and one that I find myself projecting into his work in so many different ways. The project requires a mode of assault, of attack, a sudden encounter between the photographer and the subject of the photograph. But who or what is the subject of this photograph, of a, sub, of a photograph produced under these conditions? Who submits in this scenario? The action and its impact on Hara are telling. The photographer is positioned as an assailant. The subject is a victim, subjected to an image, to an act of violence, to an image of violence. And I, I am struck yesterday in uh, yesterday's various comments that uh, Hara-san was making uh, around the various figures that he's worked with and this, uh, use, his use of the term energy of a certain kind of power, a certain flow, which is something that, that Marcus was touching upon at various points in, in his presentation as well. Of a certain circulation, let's say a force of power, of chikara, uh, chikara, chika, in a sense, a flash, as it were, and also this energy, which by definition kind of moves, circulates, isn't localized in a particular figure, but comes into sort of appears. You think about the electric shock that we are told when, when Chika falls off the balance beams. A certain uh, eruption or explosion of energy that takes place between individuals on the occasion of this violent gesture. At work in this exercise, in this image of violence, an image produced violently, is an economy of shifting subjects. One subject stalks, the other is surprised. In the encounter, two, sh two subjects share a space between them, a space that will determine between them the terms of a subjectivity that emerges. It is a fluid, dynamic, and violent space, framed by the larger field of the gesture itself. What is the subject matter of this action? And for that matter, who is the subject of this encounter? The resolution of this question remains suspended in the nature of the assignment itself. In the violent encounter between two subjects, each is left unstable in the unstable site of the encounter itself. The subject matter remains similarly in suspense, leaving the moment and those that follow it to determine the nature of the subject to arise from this action. Couldn't these conditions be said to recur in Hara's cinema over and over? Isn't his cinema one of encounter, the stakes of which return repeatedly, always to the sight of a subject undetermined until the event of encounter. A subjectivity that emerges only on this occasion, a subjectivity that emerges on the occasion of a certain loss of subjectivity. Hara's films work through a series of encounters between subjects. Marcus Nornius refers to such instances in Hara's work as intersubjective moments in filmmaking, the same passage that Miriam mentioned. Intersubjective moments in filmmaking. In many cases, these encounters are planned and staged, but change mid-course once the action begins. Takeda's birthing scene toward the end of Extreme Private Eros follows from an earlier series of encounters with Hara, her girlfriend Sugako, potential fathers for her child, including Paul, the African-American GI, and finally with the camera and audience. In this final confrontation during which Takeda gives birth unassisted in front of the camera um, and her ex-husband Hara, the latter yields the scene out of focus, subjected as it were to the withering gaze of Takeda. Uh, I was sitting with uh, Linda Williams yesterday, uh, who pointed out, uh, uh, as others have, but pointed out on the occasion of her first viewing of Extreme Private Arrows, that the affect is carried in that scene by the camera. That in the birthing scene, which is out of focus, and Hara San yesterday talked about being so overwhelmed and panicked in that moment, uh, sweating, that he's unable to get the focus on his camera right. And it's as if the affect, or a certain, let's say, expression of affectivity, of subjectivity, one could say, is transposed or transferred from Hara, who becomes himself merely a participant in this scene, to the camera, 
Uh, and I think there would be many more things to say, and of course Marcus has spoken eloquently about this, around the question of media and mediality that Aaron was touching upon, and the way in which, in a film like The Many Faces of Chika, the question of media, of the, let's say, the subject of media, of the medium, of the photographic and filmic and televisual medium, are assumed to be held in the space of masculinity. Right, of a certain masculinity. And if in that final birthing scene, in this kind of encounter with the camera, in which the terms of this scene are being dictated by Takeda Miyuki, the loss of subjectivity that is experienced at that moment by the filmmaker is recuperated, let's say, or deposited in the very strange affectation of the camera. Right? It is as if the camera is falling apart in lieu of a director who has already yielded, who has already submitted to the authority of Takeda Miyuki. And as Harakazuo said yesterday during the question and answer uh, session around extreme private arrows, that it was Takeda Miyuki who dictates the terms of that scene. Right? A scene that, as Linda Williams posed uh, as a question, in the history of, of birthing films, and most notably a film like uh, um, Window Water Baby Moving by Stan Brakhage, has always reinscribed, let's say, the point of view or the subjectivity of the male viewer vis-a-vis right, -vis the birth of a woman. And here there is this very strange occupation by Takeda Miyuki of the position of both subject and object, right, of the taisho, as, as, as Marcus and, and Aaron have pointed out, and the kind of shtai, or shtai say, the subjectivity of, of this person. The birthing scene of extreme uh, private arrows right, in front of the camera, yielding, as it were. Okazaki, unable to contain his own aggression, assaults two of his former senior military officers before announcing his plan to murder uh, another. His meetings with former military officers, uh, with family members of the bereaved, and ultimately with the filmmaker, which underlies the entire project, establish the terms by which a subject in and of the film, right, a subject within the film and the subject of the film itself, remains in flux, as unstable as Okuzaki himself, perhaps as unstable as Hara himself, or perhaps as unstable as even the film itself. Right? And one of the uh, shocking realizations about uh, Yuki Yuki right? And I think there was a, a commentary, one of the questions yesterday, which almost got there, but I feel doesn't quite get there, around the question of wartime responsibility, as it's depicted, is in the midst of this madness that is Okuzaki Kenzo, in the sheer lunacy of this figure, is an absolute sober truth absolute lucidity in the midst of this. Right? And it's a lucidity, it's a truth, it's a crime, a war crime committed by Japanese against the Japanese, against their own soldiers, by the Japanese military, by the Japanese government, that is held as a truth in the form of this uh, prophetic figure. Right? I mean, Okuzaki, by the end of the film, is, a f is somebody like Cassandra, right? who is telling the truth in with such an overflow of affect that one almost misses it. Right? When Miriam Sass talked about the famous tangerine scene, right? it's slowly pieced together through all of the denials, through all of the deflections of responsibility, of even having been in a particular place at a particular time by all these people, by the, the force of Okuzaki's personality, which is uncontainable in some sense, and what he carries in the midst of this overwhelming subjectivity is a subject matter, right? a, a crime that has been committed that can be solved, right? that he is doing, in fact, through his kind of detection that carries on through the film. And one can't help but think of these assaults that Okazaki performs against his former supervisors or commanding officers, these unannounced visits, which are themselves assaults, where he stands in a kind of suspended space, you know, various, you, one could go back and look at just the places where he is positioned in each of these, sometimes he's in the Genka, in the entrance area, at other times, like with uh, Seo, there is a refusal to let him come into the front entrance, so he stands through the sort of side entrance uh, to the house, at various times, he is confining uh, the subjects he approaches, or the subjects are there themselves confined. These unannounced visits are, in some ways, 
reproductions, reenactments of this assignment, this assault that Harakazu talks about uh, uh, himself producing as, as one of the, the tasks that was given to him. And I think of these unannounced assaults, these unannounced visits of Okuzaki, his mode, his modus operandi, his MO, as it were, as being not only violent assaults that occur through a kind of confrontation. And uh, I, I started laughing, uh, not, not quite hysterically, but almost hysterically, at the opening of Yukiuki the Shingo, which I tend to forget, because by the time the rest of the film happens, you forget this opening wedding scene where uh, Okuzaki, who, who would have him as a, as a nakodo, right? You, you were so screwed. But anyway, he shows up, and there's a strange way in, in which he is performing these functions very eloquently, right? I mean, this is not the raving madman shows up disheveled and undoes a, a, a ceremony or ritual like a wedding, but rather shows up and is able to speak in the language until you realize that he is, as part of his wedding speech, producing a certain polemic against families. <laughs> <laughs> And it's very funny. I mean, that he goes through his own list of accomplishments with the pachinko dama and the okuzaki uda and all those things that he's done and his own megalomania and narcissism is one thing. And then to move on to the bond that ties him to the groom, which is a certain critique of the establishment, is, is fine. But to end by critiquing nationality, fine. But then to critique families as those things that set up kaber, walls between people. And then you have this very awkward cut where everybody's saying, Banzai! <laughs> like, how do you move on from a speech like this? And this is also, in a way, the, the, the mode that's at work. And it makes me wonder whether that mode of the surprise, right, of the sudden encounter, of the scripted encounter that quickly becomes unscripted, right? described, as it were, uh, is at work in Hara's subjectivity, in the filmmaking that he enacts, or in the figures who seem to be throughout his films battling for control with him over the film itself. Right? Okuzaki is in a constant state of struggle with the director for control, for authority, for authorship. If you remember the, the very funny moment when two of his uh, colleagues quit you know, this project, because they don't want to do, deal with it anymore. The sister and brother of two people being killed. And, you know, he, Okazaki steps in and becomes the director of a fiction film, right? He starts assigning people from now on. You're going to be the brother, and you're, he's using his wife as the sister. And they sit there, you know, quietly during these scenes. Where he says, you don't have to say anything. I'll do all the talking. Right? It's a strange way, he's the actor and director and producer of a film within a film. Right? of a film that he's sort of taken over in Yukiuki the Shingu. And I think when Laura Marx talks about the kind of productive masochism of Harakazuo, there is a sense in which we feel from the scenes in which he is crying, to the scenes in which he appears to be being bullied by the various subjects of, of his uh, cinema. And he talked yesterday about being reduced to tears by Momoe Kaori in, in Chika, in the, the many faces of Chika. Uh, a sense in which we feel that he is a subject uh, as director who becomes a subject by being subjected to the subjects that he has nonetheless portrayed. A very complicated economy that's at work here. You think about the, the, the scene of, of, of the operation, right, of the surgical operation, uh, filmed at length in A Dedicated Life, uh, which follows this aggressive writer's submission to his body. His body. And I was very happy that, that Marcus invoked uh, this commentary, this exchange between uh, 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 Michael Moore and Harakazo. And, and, and it makes perfect sense, you know, the idea of Michael Moore, who is himself this body. Right? This, this large presence that he inscribes himself. And it's absolutely right that there is a very different relationship or a def very different movement or mobilization of the body, of bodies, that we find throughout Harakazuo's work. There is a kind of a corporeality, a certain physicality or materiality that's certainly at work in ways that doesn't happen at all in Michael Moore's filmmaking, which is powerful in its own right and has its own focus. But to note this difference, and, um, and it made me think in listening to Marcus's comments around this notion of the kidnapped body, to think about uh, the, the very sustained and devastating scene in which we see Inoue submit to this surgery, and we see large portions of his body being removed. And this is suddenly a place of, of incredible physicality and carnality, corporeality, and yet the 
the evacuation of this aggressive, domineering, lying, as Aaron points out, figure who has been using the film to tell stories, to invent things, to kind of create personae and new fictions, as it were. And suddenly we find him reduced to this body, right, this kind of physicality. And it makes me think that one of the very strange definitions that appears in all of the various dictionary definitions that I looked up uh, around subject to get how it's treated in uh, the Oxford English Dictionary or the Webster or Sunnan Bridge or Random House or other dictionaries, one that comes up over and over again is cadaver. A cadaver that's used for uh, dissection, a person as an object of medical, surgical, or psychological treatment or experiment. And it's very interesting that subject, the one who submits, the one who is subjected, sub is subjected not only to forces of power, of government, of sovereignty, but is subjected to a kind of physicality that one gives up one's body, one yields one's body as subject. And I want to hold on to this definition because I think it's absolutely at work in the corporeal cinema of Harakazu, from the, the striking scene of Yokota sort of performing a kind of happening that takes place, uh, dragging himself through the street. We hear the camera looks up into the sky, the exchanges with authority figures right, who are approaching uh, the filmmaker, asking him what he's doing, that he's creating a meiwaku, you know, the disturbance, you're bothering people, uh, move away. And then the scene of Yokota naked, right? and it's reminiscent of so many other scenes of the kind of exposure of, of, uh, of um, Inoue, of the, the portrait of Takeda Miyuki and Extreme Private Arrows, and this very striking physicality that ends the film of, of uh, Yukiyuki Teshingu, right? this gesture of Okuzaki holding up this missing finger, right? this missing fifth finger, which invokes so many different things that perhaps we could have uh, Harakazu-san and Kobayashi Sachiko-san talk about as well. This notion of kidnapped bodies, of subjects as cadavers, as objects, as it were, of experimentation, psychological and physical, of submission to a certain kind of medical force, penetration or laceration, as it were. The status of the subject in Harakazo's documentaries remains complicated by these notions of subject, subjectivity, and subjection. Uh, throughout. And one feels that there is a constant, let's say, friction that is working through these various modes or modalities of, of subjectivity uh, in his work. And that there is no, in fact, dominant uh, definition or sense of subject or subjectivity that takes precedence over another in Hara's work. The question of subjects, of being subjected to, and of subject matter. And I insist on subject matter because, as I said, uh, Hara's films take up some of the most important social political issues of his context and broader right? questions of health, of gender and sexuality, of literature and the various institutions that form around it, of authority and authorship, and of course of wartime memory and responsibility. One can never, uh, as, as Marcus was pointing out, retreat let's say, into a certain kind of subjectivity or self-indulgence in Hara's work, in part because the subject matter refuses to allow one to disengage from the spaces of the social and of the political and of the, of the public, as it were. Uh, Miriam Sass talked yesterday about a certain penetration or destruction of the private, even in the thematization of the private in, in Harakazawa's work. And so, what is the subject of Hara's cinema? What are its subjects? In a sense, Hara's cinema represents a sustained critique of subjectivity, or rather a dismantling of the terms by which subjectivity is practiced. There is perhaps no subject in Hara's cinema, no central agent or recipient of history, action, or violence. Instead, subjectivity is dispersed, spread across the field in which subjectivity becomes visible, if not possible, in the first instance. Subjectivity, subjects, subject matter, are constantly under assault in Hara's work, not unlike the exercise in which Hara discovers himself, the photographic attack. A cinema without subjects, without a subject, but rather only with energies, assaults on the subject. It defines in Hara's cinema in the echoes of this exercise that reverberate throughout his work, a mode of subjectivity that comes into being, into its own, only under assault. A suspended subjectivity, 
a surprised subjectivity, a subjectivity under assault, but more importantly, a subjectivity made possible only in the instance of assault, in the surprise and violent encounter with another that remains always here and throughout Hara's work irreducible. Thank you. こんにちはあの<笑>私以上にですね私についてここまで語られるとですね私話す言葉がありません。So, uh, I, when I'm talked about so much in this way, I'm not sure that I have anything else to say. あのでも何ていうか日本でですね、えー、私以外の人でもそうだと思いますが一人の作り手にの作品をめぐってですねここまでこういろんな観点からこう語っていくというような場がですね日本の映画の状況の中であまりないんですね。でそれがあの私今,今回、まああの今ここにサンフランシスコに今まさにここにいてですね、えー、なんかとても幸せなんですね。頭がぼーっとしてます。<笑> so、uh, you know in Japan I could say that you know for a filmmaker like me or for my generation in Japan it's really really rare to have、um, the chance to have a discourse like this around just one filmmaker、um, and so it makes me extremely happy to be here in the Bay Area and to be able to Hear that, and it's kind of making me feel spacey. あの、えー、今ねあのお話を聞きながらですねあの脈絡はないんですけれどもしかし紛れもなく、えー、あのいろんな話を聞いたそのなんて言いますかこう私の内部のこうリアクションとしてあ,あこの話とこの話はここで語っておきたいと思うことが。ありますのでそれについて喋らせてください。So, but as a, in terms of a feeling, I, I feel like there are a few things that I would like to talk about here at this moment, and so、um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and say the things that have come to me that I feel like I want to establish and say here. 一つはですね、私あのドキュメンタリーの四作品は私が自分でカメラを回しています。So for、um, four of my works, I myself was holding the camera. I was the camera person. であの自分が映した自分がカメラを回してそして成立した映像ですからあれは私が撮った絵なんだよっていうことになるんですがそれ以上にですねあの私が回してる映像がですね私のこう身体そのものであるっていう気持ちはとても強くいつも働きながらいつもカメラを回しているということがあるんですね。So、um, there's the you know when I look at the、um, footage that I take, I really see that、um, you know I think well I took it so it's my image, but there's a way in which it feels like that image itself is like my flesh. だからそういう衝動がですね、何に起因するものなのかなっていう自問自答をですね、ずっと繰り返して。えー、今日まで来てるんですが、今のお話聞いて、なんとなくあの自分の中でこういうことかなっていうことがですね、分かったような気がし一つあのしています。So having listened to the、um, various talks today, it feels to me like I've come to a new kind of realization about、um, about these images and my relation to them. あの雪きて新軍という映画の中でですね。あの奥崎さんが山田喜太郎さんに殴りかかる場面があるんですがその殴る直前のシーンあの見ていらっしゃる人はあの覚えていらっしゃると思うんですけれども奥崎さんと山田喜太郎さんが激しく応酬します。So the, there's a scene where、um, Okuzaki attacks Yamada Kichitaro in、um, The Emperor's Naked Army Marches On and Um, that is,、um, but there's a scene right before that where they have a very kind of、um, strong verbal exchange. つまり奥崎さんと山田喜太郎さんが激しく応酬してる時にですねあの時私の内部に起きた衝動というのはですね奥崎さんと山田喜太郎さんを結ぶこうラインができますよねそのラインの中にね自分が
入りたいっていう,こうとても強い衝動が働いたわけですよね。そういう思いがあって、私たちは、2人の関係を見ていて、2人の関係を見ていて、2人の関係を見ていて、2人の こうカメラのアングルをですね、こう決めていくというふうに取るのがま礼儀と言いますか、一つの礼節なんでしょうけれども、あの時の私の衝動というのはその二人の目線を壊してでも構わない。いや壊れはしないと。そのなんて言います
あのでその一瞬がつまり私にとってこう自由っていう感覚なんだろうって思うんですよね。でだから私にとって一番あのなんか表現をしたいという衝動の中で一番大切なキーワードはまさにこう自由っていいますか自己解放という感覚なんだと思うんです。So one of the um, when I'm looking for that That moment, that's the moment for my filmmaking.、Um, I think that one of the most important points of my filmmaking is what I call freedom or a certain kind of liberation, a release. And that, that's what the meaning is of that particular moment. Chika was, this is, 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 落ちていくことが自由っていう感覚とそこでこうつ,つながるんですよね。私自身の、えー、持ってるこう現衝動とあのチカさんの物語のベースにあるこう落ちていくで落ちていってあのー、表面的には、えー、なんて言いますか、えー、社会的にこう落ちぶれていくというような物語であるんで。ちょっと悲劇的な要素があるかもしれないけれども、結局チカさんはこう自由へ向かって自由へ向かってこう生きていったっていうか、だからチカさんは女性なんですけれども、私自身のその衝動をですね、チカさんがこうある意味こう体現しているというふうな感じがあるんです。So when we think about Chika that we were talking about later, there's a way in which this idea of freedom connects to that、um, film about Chika that Chika, from on, a, on the surface, it looks like she's a tragic figure and she falls. But to me, the meaning of that fall is a fall towards freedom. She's living towards a certain kind of liberation, freedom, release, or however you want to translate that. And that she's moving and pushing in that direction with her life, even if on the surface it looks like she's falling apart. And you know, although she's a woman, there's a way in which I myself feel represented by or connected to that search for freedom that is her. あの奥崎さんっていう人はですねあのまあ、えー、前科三犯だっていうようなことをですね自慢しておりますけれども奥崎さんにとってつまり犯罪が表現なわけですねもうストレートにそうなんですねで犯罪を起こして刑務所に入りますで奥崎さんの場合必ず独居房なんですよね。So in the case of Okuzaki, Um, you know, it's often said that he's really one of a kind. There's no one like him before and no one like him since. And for him, his expression or his art in a way is crime. And he goes to, the, he goes to jail. But this is the way he expresses his.、Um, his さんは刑務所の中にいる間だけですね、つまり自由なんですね。で、刑期を終えて出国してきます。で、出国してきてですね、えー、しばらくは、まあ、生活を立て直すために一生懸命に働くんですが次第にですね、えー、こんなことしてていいのかとで何かしなくちゃいけないんじゃないか、えー、戦友はたくさん死んでるんだとで自分はその何かをするために生かされてきたんであるということでだんだんこう何かこう間が,間がですね取りつくような感じになって追い立てられるようにして自分にとって次のターゲットは何かっていうことをこう探していくというそういうパターンなんですよね。そして犯罪を犯して刑務所に戻って独居部にいてあ奥崎さんそこでまた本当に限られた時間ですけど自由になっていくっていう。So in the case of Okazaki, you know, you could think about how he,、um, you could say that actually only when he's in jail is he truly free. Um, you know, he eventually he's in jail and then he gets out of jail, and for a while he works to make his living.、Um, but eventually he starts to ask himself, What was I made? To, what am I here to do? What was I allowed to live to do when all these people died? And there's this kind of space that happens, and then he starts to search for his next target.、Um, and so he then eventually looks for his next target for his next crime. This から。あの私があの絶対の自由を求めて別の言い方をすれば自分がこうコッパみじんに壊れる瞬間を求めてカメラを回していくっていうことと奥崎さんが刑務所の中にいて自由なんだっていうこととですねどっかでこうあの掃除性って言います
あの全くこう共通してるっていう感じが、えー、してならないんですよね。So I actually have to make this link there when with this issue of the search for this absolute freedom between、um, what happens Um, you know, what I was speaking about before and this search that Okuzaki goes through. で、奥崎さん、じゃあ、刑務所の中が自由かって言ったって、それは刑務所の中なわけですからね。えー、奥崎さんにとって、えー、刑務所の中が自由であるっていうことは、つまり、えー、我々はシャバの方が自由であると思ってる、その全くこう逆説というふうな説明はもちろんつくんです。えー、だけれども奥崎さんが刑務所の中で自由であるっていう言い方はですねでも本当のところ、えー、それ自体は奥崎さんはとらわれてるわけですよねで私にしても、えー、絶対自由を求めて自分が壊れる瞬間を求めてカメラを回していくで壊れた瞬間っていうのが一瞬つかの間成立するしかしその次の瞬間はですねその,瞬あの自由という感覚が永続していかないわけですから。さらにまたですね、次のつかの間の自由という感覚を求めて、またこう、えー、悪戦苦闘する旅がまた始まっていくという、そういう感覚なんでしょうかね。So, um, so you know, you might think that it sounds incredibly paradoxical to say that Okazaki is free when he's in jail. You think of jail as precisely the opposite of freedom.、Um, but for me also,、um, that kind of searching for that moment when I break. Or when the, the moment breaks in my,、um, in my filmmaking, when it cracks open,、um, that's something that is for me linked to that idea of absolute freedom. So if you achieve that absolute freedom in that one moment,、um, that's great, but you just can't, it just can't continue. You, that moment just lasts one moment and then it's over and you're back to what was before.、Um, and so then I have to continue and push forward with my documentary quest and look for the next, my next target kind of. Making a comparison between his pattern and Okuzaki's pattern. Even three people's talking about it, I'm thinking about it in my mind. I'm listening to it. Thank you very much. So that's what kept、uh, running through my head when I was listening to everyone. Thank you so much for having me. So we can now open the floor if there are any questions or comments from anyone here. Are we going to try to record it?、Yeah. So, the thing that really struck me watching these two films back to back yesterday was that the protagonists share not just kind of physicality or corporeality, but a certain kind of athleticism or an emphasis on physical strength. And self sufficiency in their, their physicality. So I was thinking about that specifically.、Um, so, in、uh, um, Takana Miyuki's case, there's this assertion, not just in these great dance scenes, but also of having the baby individually and being completely self sufficient and kind of asserting this biological power. And then in Okazaki's case, the, 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 the ever present threat to, to bring it to the level of a physical fight. And conversely, there's kind of a disdain for physical weakness in both films, where、uh, Takeda is, says she doesn't want to raise a weak baby or someone who's too gentle. And Okazaki actually raises physical infirmity to a political issue, that it's, it's a, a manifestation of a political failure. So I was thinking about that in terms of the discussion that surrounded、uh, the films yesterday and today. It's mainly gone in kind of an energetic、uh, discourse. It's talk about energy or ki or.、Um, Kind of the way these energies are being transformed. But I was curious if it's possible to think of it more, like really stick to the physical a little bit. It's in the Zenshin idea, but especially in the way that the, this has seemed to translate into a historiographic move, so that the way contemporary documentary or contemporary film is talked about as a weakness or as, as a lack of a strong subject. I'm curious if that ties in at all with、um, the kind of physicality or maybe kind of athleticism. It's really pushed for and tied up with politics、uh, in the films we watched yesterday. I'm just curious if anyone had any comments on that specifically.
we can have an answer from anyone. Do you, you want to pick? Would anyone like to respond to the idea of weakness and strength and, and valuing of strength? It's great to hear from, from Harasan himself on this subject. I, I, you know, I, I, it's an excellent question. I mean, it, it's more really a, your own kind of observation and reading of this. But I would only point out the, um, the relation, I mean, you're absolutely to talk about the athleticism, right? And the, I mean, the, the incredible prowess of somebody like Okuzaki at 62, who seems, you know, remarkably fit. But this relationship between energy and bodies is a very interesting problem, right? And one that I think is not um, just given. I think in a way the, the films, Hara's films, energize these bodies. It's an effect of the cinema as well. It's not merely that there are these virile, kind of uh, explosive, energetic bodies as such, even though they are, Takeda Miyuki's and Okuzaki Kenzo's are, but there is a way in which the whole process of this film and the very complex way in which these bodies are mobilized, right, quite literally moved around. And if you think about both of the films that we saw today, these are, these are bodies that, that are not just in motion, but these are bodies that are moving from place to place, right? To Indonesia, to Okinawa, these are bodies in transit in a certain way. And the film becomes an occasion to, to charge, as it were, the bodies. And I think it would be interesting to think about the relationship between the energization of bodies and these bodies that are themselves, let's say, already athleticized or energized, and to really try to discover what the relationship between a body that is volatile, valuable, explosive, uh, already, and what the cinema does to those bodies. Right? Because you feel the effect of the cinema, of the camera, of the presence of the project uh, around this body, also is one of the sources of the athleticism that you know. The, the ways in which the bodies are also performing because the occasion or space or frame is, is made available for that kind of athleticism. あの答えになるかどうかは、えー、自信がないんですが、えー、肉体についてですね、えー、第1作目の「さよなら CP」の時、えー、こんなふうに考えてたんですね。あのあの英語でもありますかこういう言葉つまり身体障害者っていう言葉がまずあるんですね身体をの障害の人たちっていう言葉があってですね身体の障害を持ってない人のことを健全者っていう日本語はそういう言い方するんですが英語でもありますか so in English, is there a word like,、um, there's this word in Japanese that means like Um, physically disabled person, and it's assumed that everyone who's not a physically disabled person is a physically okay person or a healthy person. But that term itself exists with that sense of physical and that sense of like harm, suffering, disability,、um, damaged,、um, in, that's inherent in the very term. あのー、あの横田さんと話を随分僕らはあの映画を撮影のを通していろんな話をしたんですけれども健全者って言われる私はですね自分の身体が健全なのってどうもピンとこないんですね言葉が。自分の身体があなたは健全者ですってつまり障害者の人がいるから健全者という言葉が、えー、やっぱり必要だからそこで使われていて僕なんか健全者というふうに規定されるしかし規定される私は、えー、自分が健全な肉体を持った人という感覚はまるで自分の,あの肉体と言葉がですね、えー、しっくりこないんですよね。So when I was、uh, working with Yokota on this film, 
you know, I became in the category of this Ken Zensha or this like perfectly healthful body. And when I thought about that, is that a good translation of Ken Zen? How would you translate it? Healthy, like health, health, good, completion, complete, um, you know, and I thought that doesn't really quite feel like a match to how I feel about my own body. で横田さんもですね同じこと言うんです自分が身体障害者っていうふうに言いますけれども横田さんは脳性麻痺っていうその出産時における、えー、何らかの障害が、まあ、身体的に影響を及ぼすという状態なんですねだけど横田さんにとってはああいうふうに膝でいざって歩くというのがですね横田さんの一番馴染んでる感覚であってですね障害社という感覚はないんで彼はしきりに言ってましたもんね。So、uh, like he can do things like walk on his knees and there's questions about exactly where is the e n e r the the origins of this disability and、um, you know he just said this especially this word shogai which is kind of like you know damage or something、um, this word this disability word just didn't he didn't feel like that was really a precise match for his situation either. ですからあのどういうことかっていうと、えー、じゃあ現実的に身体障害者っていわれる言葉が存在しているっていうことは社会の中でそういう規範が間違いなくあるわけですよねその規範があるから身体障害っていう言葉が、えー、成立しててそして、えー、健全者えー、とですね、えー、身体障害者というふうなことを区別するという言葉がですね我々の身体をこうコントロールしていくといいますか抑圧するといいますか、えー、まさに何、あのー、ていうか制度の中に絡め取られていくというかそういう関係だと思うんですね。So, you know, when I think about those two words, And talk with him about them, I, it becomes incredibly clear that there are these regulations, a regulatory process going on through you know, the social structure that pressures or oppresses us in a certain way by dividing,、um, kind of in a Foucauldian way. The, you know, the,、um, I added the Foucault, but you know, the, um, <laughs> the,、um, you know, the difference between、um, the, those with disabilities and those that are not, and keeping that line、um, very precisely regulated. あのですから「さよなら CP」っていう映画はそういうその横,田横田さんともちろんそれにカメラを向けてる私とがですね、えー、お互いを縛っている、えー、つまりあのなんていうかあの自由にさせない力を,を壊そうじゃないかっていうことが、えー、一番大きなこう、えー、動機なんですねあの映画を作ったこう一番ベースのエネルギーというのはね。So, the fundamental energy or motivation that started me on this film was the sense that、um, we were both mutually bound by these definitions and I, we were not free, and that we needed to actually break that definition that was binding both of us. The Kyokushiki Eros the Ega mo, Jose no Jose Sega desne, Koka kara sono Kandi Sareteru tiuka, Honlai, Onna no Stoka Motteru Sintai Seo ma, Ano, Sono Onna no Stono Se to Yukota, Kenkyo ni Ko Hyogen Sare noga, Masu San tiu Koi de Aruake de Sho kara, Sono Shu San o Jibun no Mono ni Ko, Tori Kai Skoto ga, Jose Se no desne, Tsmari, Ano, 拘束されているとか抑圧されている身体というイメージからこう自己解放するというようなことをですね、局地的要素はやるべきであるというふうに考えていましたね。So when it comes to extreme privacy, eros, I was kind of trying to do something analogous in terms of female sexuality and female bodies that I thought, you know, that the biological or the body's power to give birth is one of the primary powers, but it's incredibly regulated and Um, and structured socially, and so I wanted that kind of liberation or setting free of the female body to take control of, of birth in that moment. そんなふうに考えて、まあ、映画を作ってるもんですから今の質問の中で、えー、パニッシュメントっておっしゃいましたかねそこはちょっと私ごめんなさい聞いててちょっとよくその
真意が理解できてないんですがどういうことなんでしょうかね私は今そんなふうに考えて映画は作ってたんですけれど。So this is the kind of thing that I was、um, doing when I was making the films and but then the word punishment came in I think it was in in Aki's presentation you know in relation to masochism and stuff in the Laura Marx there was something about or maybe it was in the Chica about wanting to the male wanting to punish the woman didn't you say the word punish punishment so I think Oh, but I don't know. In the question, did you use the word punish? Yeah, I think he's thinking about when we were trying to translate your presentation, too, and he wanted to think a little more about what this punishment, what, what is that exactly? Because definitely it's not, he doesn't mean, he didn't think of it that way himself in terms of punishment, or maybe even in terms of what you're saying about disparaging the weaker body, something like that. So、um, that wasn't really his intention. Do you want to?、Yeah. Um, this idea of your films being masochistic goes back to a critic, I can't remember his name, shortly after Yuki Tishingun, I think. And、uh, other people have picked it up as well. I've, you know, I've heard Laura Marx, Karatani Kojin has used it.、Uh, and it's always Well, I have ideas about it, but I'm curious what he thinks.、Um, yeah, let's hear what Hara san thinks of that idea. I know, Kare no shisumun wa punishment tiyu ko kotoba ga, doka ko masochistic tiyu kanke no mono o kare to shite wa ko kanji totte, sono koto shite kite rin jana nakaro ka tiyu koto desu ka? ね、あの日本語ではあのサ,ドサドとマゾとサ,ドサディズムマゾヒズムって別のものだっていうふうな感覚が、まあ、ありましてっていうか私はそんな感覚で思ってたんですがアイオワ大学でしたねアイオワ大学であのシンポジウムがありまして私もまあそこに呼ばれて参加してたんですがサドマゾあのあのサゾマゾっていうサゾヒズムとマゾヒズムを別に使うんじゃなくてサゾマゾヒズムってセットで使うんだってそこで私を教えられてなんか目が開いたような感じになりましたね<笑>つまり「あのさよなら CP」っていうのは非常にサディスティックな映画だろうっていうふうに私は思ってるんですねで、えー「極地的ロス」っていうのは非常にマゾヒティックな映画なんだろうなって自分で思ってるんですねでえー、そういうことを唐谷浩二さんっていう人から指摘されて全くその通りだっていう感じがあってで原さんは非常にマゾシティックな人なんですねっていうふうに、えー、決めつけられてしまいましたがまあ「さぞまぞ」というのはあの縦の、ね、コインの両面ですからどっちかだけってことはありませんもんね。つまり、えー、サディスティックにサディスティックにカメラを向けながらですね、えー、時には像を自分の中で持ちながらですねその像をですねレンズを通して相手にこう、えー、ぶつけていくっていうようなことをやる場合があるんです多々あるんですね。あので、えー、しかしその、えー、サディスティックなこう、えー、暴力衝動というものがレンズを通して相手に届いていった時に何て言いますか相手,相手の方からですね、えー、それに何て言うか、えー、倍するような2倍も3倍も大きな力がですね、えー、返ってくることがあって、えー、その時にはこちらが何て言うかこう、えー、自己破壊をこうそこでこう起こしていくっていう感覚があるんですね。で、えー、まさにしかしそういう感覚を求めて映画を撮っていくっていう感じが、えー、ありますので,でそういう意味で言うと。非常にあの、えー、パニッシュメントっていうよりもむしろそれがですね非常にやばい言い方すれば快感だったりするんですねこれ正直に言いましてだから今あのマークの方から、えー、指摘があったそのサドマズヒズミってどう思うかっていうことで言うとですね、えー、さっき私が言いました奥崎さんと山田吉太郎さんのえー、まさに、えー、激鉄してってそこがこう渦巻いてるって言いますか非常にね
あの混沌としてですね、えー、でその中に自分を投げ入れてですね自分がこうめちゃめちゃになればいいっていう感覚で自分をこう投げ入れたいという衝動が働くんですね。でその一瞬というのはですね、えー、何者にも変え難いまさにドキュメンタリーの醍醐味っていう感覚はあります。紛れもなくあります。Uh, so, um, so he's talking about this word、um, sadism and masochism, and he says that actually, when he went to、um, the University of Iowa,、um, he went to a symposium where they told him that although in Japanese sadism and masochism are two different things,、um, they, they explained that it's actually one that should be used as a set sadomasochism, and that it's actually、uh, really goes together and it's two sides of the same coin. And so there have been various.、Um, Critics, including Karatani Kojin, who have talked about his films as having a masochistic side, um, and um, that that is probably right,、um, but you have to think about it in that kind of more, more as a set or more of two sides as two sides of the same coin. That maybe you come to, with the camera towards your subject with a certain kind of violence and a certain kind of.、Um, Assault, but then it comes back to you two or three times as powerful from the other side, and then you yourself can break apart. A certain kind of breaking、um, happens, and so I don't think punishment is really quite the right word. But there's this kind of like with Okuzaki, there, as I spoke about before, there's this kind of chaos that takes place, this kind of mixing. You go in and you kind of get messed up, and there's that moment where you get mixed up. That is the key point and key intention of documentary. And so maybe there is a way in which this set of terms works together、um, and is accurate in talking about my work. Could I follow that up? To follow that up,、um, I'd like to ask you if you've seen the sequel to Yuki Yuki Tishingu. I th you must know this. Okay, so I mean,、uh, when I think, I'll tell you about it.、Um, when, this, uh, when I think of the sequel to Yuki Yuki t i s h i n g u n this masochism, sadism model doesn't seem to work at all, actually. I think it's much more complicated and actually. Very much like what Akira was talking about. I mean, it was a wonderful description of Hara cinema. But the sequel, <laughs>、um, I heard about actually when Dairaku Dakan came to Ann Arbor, the Buto troop, and the Akaji Maro's assistant was called over and introduced to me as the guy who's making the sequel to. Ex the Emperor's Ar Naked Army. Naturally, I was intrigued. And、uh, a few years later, I, mean, I tried to find out more about what he was up to, but he just he smiled. He refused to talk about it.、Uh, it finally came out, and、uh, I had a chance to look at it. It turns out that this director、um, is actually a director of AV. So he does the really hardcore porno. And、uh, when Okazaki was rebuffed by Hara san, he wanted, still wanted to make a film and found a director, this guy. And、um, it's a brutal film, truly brutal film, very hard to watch.、Um, the idea that Okazaki is the sadist, and there's something masochistic about Hara's practice.、Uh, is challenged by this film because, in this case, it's completely flipped. And it shows the kind of power that the filmmaker has because in, Okazaki is brought in and he's made a fool of from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, you know, he's become very religious and he's always kind of praying like this, constantly like this. So the filmmakers start going like this to make him happy. But then they, they're making fun of, they're actually making fun of him, of course. And then they start subjecting him to all sorts of things.
it gets worse and worse and worse until finally they discover that he's, he hasn't had sex forever. And so they call in an AV actress, prostitute probably, and uh, they have sex for the camera and it culminates in her shitting on him. It's really hard to watch. So uh, when I saw this, I thought it was very instructive. I mean, I learned a lot about Hara actually, and I learned a lot about documentary because I think uh, the, what's going on is, has nothing to do with masochism or sadism. Um, because this would also call, into the quest, the, call up the question of pleasure, right? For one thing. I think it's much more about what documentary filmmakers do. A conventional documentary practice subjects at subjects to the intentions and the will of the filmmaker. But what's happening in the best films of Japan is something much more akin to what Aki was talking about, where there is the subjection going on, but subjectivity also gets dispersed, and you have all of these frictions, um, assaults in different directions, suspensions and surprises, and uh, that's what makes it really special. It's a stance. It's a stance. And uh, he's taken one, I think, that's actually very similar to many of his cohort, many other filmmakers, but he does it in a much more provocative and challenging and surprising way. The AV director with the same subject matter, Okazaki, right? completely subjected him, and it was easy. No problem. Okazaki tamed. Yeah? He says it's really horrible. He hates it. He does know about it. It's horrible. あの、あの、新軍の、え、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、
um, side of Okuzaki when we were in New Guinea. でもいいんですかね。奥崎建造における性的欲望、その欲望の抑圧の構造というような話になっていくんですが、そういう話をここでしていいんでしょうかね。いいんですか。Yes, okay. He says, is it okay to talk about、um, Okuzaki's sexuality in this forum? I think so. えー、っといいということなので続けます。<笑>あのあのつまりですね。ニューギニアにロケに行きましたでニューギニアに行きましたインドネシア領なんでイン,デシインドネシアの,あのつまり、えー、領土の中なんです行ったところがねそれで非常にローカルな都市に一つだけホテルがあるとそのホテルに我々は泊まったんですでまあ奥崎さんがですね、えー、そこで一つの騒動を起こしますえー、ホテルのフロントに行きましてですね「俺は天皇にパチンコを打った男だぞてめえらな何だと思ってやがる」っつって大声で騒ぎを起こすとそうするとホテルの人はびっくり仰天して警察を呼ぶわけですで警察が「何でお前はこんなに騒いでんだ」「俺はここで、えー、元の日本兵だったと」と「俺の戦友がたくさん死んだと」とその慰霊に俺は来たんだと。貴様ら俺をなぜ入れに行かさないんだって警官にまた喧嘩を売るわけです。だ警官は自分じゃどうしようもなくて軍警察にこう行くわけです。だ軍の方から軍人が来てお前何を騒いでるんだっていうふうにですね、まあ、奥崎さんにまあ尋問すると。で奥崎さんはそこで軍人のかなり偉い人に対して賄賂を使ってですねで自分が行きたいところに行こうとするという。ことがまあそこで起きていくんですね。So, uh, in the front desk and started to shout about his situation. I'm the one who shot pachinko balls at the emperor and I used to be,、um, uh, you know, you can imagine, and, and I used to be a Japanese soldier and many, many Japanese soldiers died and it really shocked the people at the front desk and they didn't know what to do so they called the police. But the police didn't quite know what to do either so they,、um, Called the army police, who and he tried to bribe one of the top army、um, people to go where he wanted to go, where they weren't really allowed to go. で、えー、そんなふうに奥崎さんが、えー、インドネシアの軍の、えー、将校に対してですね、まあ自分が自分の戦友がたくさん死んだところへ行きたいとしかし、えー、そこの場所というのは実は、えー、民族解放戦線といいますかゲリラ闘争が戦われてるっていうことのエリアなんですねだからそう簡単に行けないだけどそこに行きたいということで、えー、奥崎さんに尋問した若い将校にですね、えー、日本円で1万円札10枚ぐらいかな渡すんですね。それでそのホテルで一番いい料理をどう食べてくださ食べてください食べてください。で原さん原さんの腕時計を貸してくださいっつって貸してあげたらその腕時計を相手にプレゼントしちゃったりね。<笑>そんなことをしながらあので自分は戦友のためにですね、えー、なんとか慰霊行為をずっとしてきたんだって涙を流してですねもうなんとかもう。大演技をそこで展開するんです。それを私はずっとカメラを回してたわけなんです。So,、um, things that happened there were that he was, you know, he went to this army officer and he tried to bribe him because the area where they had been and where he wanted to go was,、um, was blocked off. You weren't permitted to go in there for certain reasons in the current、uh, political situation. And so he gave maybe、um, something like 10, 10,000 yen notes, like 100,000 yen to this officer. And then he asked,、um, Me to、um, lend my watch, and he tried to give my watch as a present to this person. And he basically and he cried and he did、uh, a big performance.、Um, and I was、um, had my camera rolling the whole time. Yeah, so then, eh, ma, so no, who knew, Okuzaki Sanga, ma, what I shall meet, Okuzaki Sama, yo, gamba, te, ya, te, haru, at, te, you, who knew, omo, te, do, akes, so no, toki, wa, ne, so, re, de, yo, do, na, do, to, ma, Okuzaki Sanga, jibun, no, hea, de, ma, 部屋があるでしょで奥崎さんが「自分は疲れたからあのマッサージの人を呼びます」と僕らに言ったんですよ。それでえ「じゃあ奥崎さんがそのマッサージを受けてるっていう場面を撮っていいですか?」ってつまり映画的に言うと、まあ、ちょっとしたあのインサートの
あの映像ですよねそんなに深い意味はない本当に軽い映像の旅の一コ,一コマ、まああのえー、奥崎さんその時は62歳かな、えー、その62歳の、えー、体をまあ鞭打ってですね懸命に頑張ってるっていうような意味合いで。あんまさんの、えー、マッサージを受けてる映像を撮っていいですかねっつったら奥崎さんいいですよってことになってその撮影をしたわけですわ。でその翌日ですね、えー、朝になってすぐじゃなくて昼ぐらいになってね実は原さん私そのマッサージの人とセックスをしたんですよって告白されたわけです。So、um, then,、uh, so he, so that whole thing with the bribery and trying to get in and everything, I was, I thought, great, you know, this is very Okazaki and I got it on camera and great job. And then at the end of it all, he went back to his room and he was very tired and he called a massage person in. And so I thought, well, I don't know if I should really take this, you know, these films of this 62 year old body getting massaged, but I did take the films. And then,、um, And then I left, and then the next day,、um, Okazaki confessed to me that he had had sex with the masseur. And sex was a very important thing to me. I was very happy to say that 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 I was very happy to say that. だから私がセックスさせてくださいってもちろんお金を私は払いましたよとお金を払わないと相手の人がセックスを応じてくれるわけありませんからねわっはっはと笑いながらですねその話をするわけですだから原さんが悪いんですよわっはっはと笑いながらですねそういう話をしてくれたんですよ。So then he said, well, why did this happen? It was because you were there, 原さん You were taking those films and so He thought I was someone very, she thought I was someone very, very important. And so she offered to have sex with me if I would pay. And, but the reason that, it, that she offered was because she thought I was someone really important. And that was your fault. So ha 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 ha. Then, so it was a little bit of 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 a 頼んでたんですがその人が面白いところを連れて行ってあげるって言い出して奥崎さん行く行くっつってで私もしょうがなくついて行ったら結局町外れにあるつまり売春をするエリアなんですよねでそれが本当に掘ったて小屋みたいな小屋がいくつかあってで、えー、その通訳をやってくれた現地の人が「来い来い」っつって中に入っていく。で掘ったって小屋ですからこうドアがあるわけじゃなくて簡単にこのすだれみたいなのがあってですねそれをこう引っ張れば中が覗けるわけですよでそこでセックスがまさにこう展開してるわけですよでそこをこう奥崎さんはですねあっちを覗きこっちを覗きっていうことがまあ,あってですねこんな話していいんでしょうかはい。Um, like a little、uh, area with curtains that you could open and a、uh, kind of prostitution area. So you could peek in, and, and he was going around opening the curtains and peeking in. あの時間がないそうですから、大急ぎで話をします。何が言いたいかって言いますとですね、その後実はあのニューギアのフィルムも全部没収されますけれども、えー、没収された後ですね、あのその没収されたところの、えー、オフィスがあるんです軍事警察のその軍事警察の人が言うにはですね、えー、大使館に行きなさいって言われたんですで我々奥崎さんと一緒に大使館に行ったんですでそれは手よくあしらわれたんですすぐにはフィルムは帰りませんよとで外務省に行きなさいで、えー、じゃあ外務省に
行かないとどうしようもないからって外務省に行くんですがでそういうことがあるその途中にですねインドネシアジャカルタで45日滞在してたんですでその時にも奥崎さん実はですねそこでそのマッサージをしてくれるという名目で女の人を呼んでてそこでやっぱりお金を払ってですねセックスをまあしてもらったといいますかでそこで奥崎さん私にこう言ったんです。私は今まで刑務所生活が長くでえー、自分の奥さんとの間に子供がいないんだとだから、えー、そのインドネシアの,その、ね、セックスの相手をしてくれる人にお金を払ってですね自分の子供を産んでくださいということをお願いしたんですとであの明日またもう一度その人を呼んでありますから私がぜひその子供を産んでくださいという。ことをお願いしている場面,場面をぜひ原さんにとってほしいとこういう話になっていくんですね。So、um, the reason why I'm trying to shorten this story because it's pretty intense, but you know this is the story of the whole second half of Yukikite Shingun, which was confiscated all that film, and、um, and so you know we actually spent quite a while in Jakarta, and we were told to go to the consulate, and we were told to go to the embassy, and we were trying to get these films back or figure out what was going on with these films, and all this time.、Um, Uh, Okuzaki was explaining to me that you know, he had this very long life in jail, and he and his wife had never had children, and he had suddenly really, really wanted to have a child. And so he had called these, this masseuse and requested that、um, they have sex and that she have a child and that he be able to have a child with her. And he requested for Harasan to film the scene in which he makes the offer to. Um, have a child with this masseuse and pay her. でちょっと省略して先に進みますがそのことをですね、えー、神戸に帰って奥さんに告白するとで自分はインドネシアの人に子供を産んでもらうということを、えー、お金を払ってですけれどもお願いするんだということで、まあ、セックスをしたということも含めて神戸に帰ったら妻に謝るんだと。で同時に子供をあを産んでもらいたいということの了解を奥さんに取るっていうんですよね。でその場面もぜひ原さん撮影してくださいと、まあ、こういうふうに私言われ,て言われたわけです。So then Okuzaki said he also really, really wanted Harasan to film the scene in which he、um, apologizes to his wife for having sex with someone else and in which he asks her permission to、um, have this child with this Indonesian person. So he wanted that also to be on film. でこの話を細かくしだすと時間がありませんので飛ばします。で本にあのカヤから出していただいた本には詳しく書いてありますからぜひ続きは読んでください。<笑> And so、um, if you want to hear the rest of the story,、um, I've actually written up quite a bit more of it in the book that is、um, Camera Abstrusa, which contains the production notes and all the Unbelievable drama and、um, craziness that went on in the process of trying to work with Okuzaki Kenzo and the ethical issues as well that were raised on so many levels. So I ask you to please, um, please um, read the book and you'll hear the rest of the story. で本に書いてないことを一つだけ紹介しておきますと奥崎さんは、えー、と2年前に亡くなりましたけど亡くなったあ亡くなるちょっと前あの日本で。えー、ソープランドって言いますがソープランドで気に入った女の子がいたらしいんですが借金をしてね通い詰めてたらしいんですよそれでその気に入った女の子に自分の子供を産んでくれって頼んでたそうです。So in fact he actually did kind of carry this out、um, this is not written in the book but that there was someone in the,、um, the kind of sex trade in Japan soap land Um, that he also had as someone that he really liked, and he had a savings, and he had also asked this person to have his child. あの奥崎さんの映画つまり雪降って新軍のパート2をですね奥崎さんに撮ってくれっていうふうに言われてたんですが、もし私は撮らない方がいい撮るべきじゃないって判断ししたしたんですねで。撮らなかったけど、もし撮ってればですよ、そういうその奥崎さんの奥崎さんのなんて言いますか抑圧された性の世界を取ったのかなっていうふうな気もするんですがでもねそんな映画見たくもないんじゃないかなと思うし私もそ,そういう映画を撮りたいっていうふうに私は思わなかったですもんね
So I actually was asked to make a part two movie about Okuzaki, and I thought if I were to make that movie, um, it would probably be some, somehow involving this um, sort of sex world of Okuzaki. And I thought, well, that's probably what the movie would be about, but I don't want to see a movie like that, and I don't really want to make a movie like that. So in the end, I said no. Anyway, let's uh, let's thank um, our panelists and um, Harasan and.